Everyone knows the feeling of hunger, and yet some have never seen it. He yourself may have claimed to be starving, empty, famished, or hungry, but have you yourself ever encountered the merciless beast we call hunger? Have you ever considered that the thing you call starving is only the fingernail of the monster that plagues the minds and souls of the innocent and sane? Breathing down your neck and clawing at your skin with crimson-covered nails, desperate to get inside, only blocked from you gobbling down cheeseburgers, pizza, and donuts. And yet if you have come close to hunger, some of the worst instances of mass hunger known as famines have plagued us for centuries. Ireland 1845, Russia 1921, China 1959. And yet even in these stages of hunger, when people's teeth were gnawed and broken from eating leather and dirt, and animals had a feast of the bones and human remains, very few have ever seen hunger. Few have seen the Wendigo. All the Wendigo ever feels is hunger. That's because it is hunger. You may have heard of the Wendigo or seen drawings of it. But for the few who have seen it, for most it was the last thing they ever saw. I haven't seen it. No. Thank God I haven't. Yet the old members in my family have stared at it in its hollow eyes. This is not my story. It's my father's. When I was around the age of 15, he told me to sit down next to him, pointing to the brown cloth chair. I was old enough to know why he never lets me set foot in the woods. Why we never go up north, especially never when it's winter. I recorded it all. He requested for that. Wanted a record of what happened to him, to make sure no one else went through it like he did. This is what he told me. Father's story. He takes out a cigarette and clicks a lighter until a small blaze and puts the small flame to his cigarette before starting. My uncle decided it was time for me to visit the Great Lakes forests. He told me the woods were some of the most beautiful in the whole country. It took a lot of convincing until your grandfather decided it was fine for me to visit the north. Of course, when he made the decision, it was winter by then. The winter down here is a light breeze compared to the freeze up in the north. Cold days and dark icy nights. It's a wonder how the Native Americans managed to survive months of thick snow and the creatures that came with it. He pauses to take another puff of his cigarette before continuing. This didn't stop my uncle, who had prepared in case we had to go during the winter. For both me and him, as if we were going to the Arctic. Thick puffy jackets, boots, and gloves as well as goggles, in case we came upon a storm on a walk. As well as bear spray if we came across wild animals. He also packed something else. A desert eagle, the ones those cops have in the movies. He didn't actually expect to use it, it was just in case we came across a bear or lynx and things got close and personal. He pauses and stares at his right foot. He definitely didn't think we needed it for something different. It was around mid-November when we took the plane to the state of Michigan. He had purchased a standard hotel room in a small town. He refused to say its name, and we spent a few days simply getting used to the sceneries of where we were. My uncle was right. It was beautiful. Actually, I don't even think the word beautiful cuts it. I could see the edge of the forest by my window. The trees were tall, like long hairs protruding from the head of Mother Nature, and along those hairs light the fleas. Squirrels, chipmunks, birds, and the occasional wolf and fox would pass by before despairing in the shadow of the trees. I'll tell you, even now I do miss seeing the trees and watching the wind blow the tall pines in harmony. He sighs and puts out his cig on his wooden chair. But I know I can never go back there. Almost every day we went on hikes, with the snow crunching beneath our feet, stopping every so often to witness the wildlife. Once or twice we came across a bear. I was scared of course, but my uncle had faced plenty in his time living there, so of course he knew what to do. Don't look them in the eyes he would whisper to me, as he pulled out his bear spray, just in case. And eventually, it would move along, searching for some berries to eat. It was around our second week there when my uncle decided to take me on my first night walk. So, we put on our coats, snow boots, and brought along the bear spray in Desert Eagle. It was somehow even more gorgeous in the dark than it was in the day. The stars flowed above us like fireflies welcoming us to the forest, as the moon as big and bright as ever hovered above us. We walked until we came upon a fork in the path. We usually would go left, as it's much longer so we could experience the forest more. 
but it was a lot colder than usual, so my uncle decided it was best to get back sooner rather than later. For some reason, the colder weather did hang in my mind for longer than it should have. Although the weather could be unpredictable, the weather news where I was was more accurate than the ones down in the north. This thought slept my mind eventually, reasoning that every news channel got it wrong eventually. So we continued, but as we went, it just kept getting colder and colder. By this point, my uncle repeatedly kept looking up at the sky, with a bewildered look on his face. Looking up I saw not a single cloud in the sky, nothing to indicate a snowstorm was coming or anything that would cause the weather to get this cold. Soon my uncle put me close to him to make us warmer. It wasn't a long hike back, just a mile or so. Then it was clear something was wrong, more than the weather. As we kept walking, we went faster. We heard something walking around us. My uncle jerked his head in that direction, instinctively pulling out his bear spray. Looking past him, I could clearly see several pairs of eyes in the shadow of the trees, moving fast and toward us. My uncle had quickly raised the bear spray and put himself in front of me, screaming to get back. Looking over, I could now clearly see it was a pack of wolves, mouths open, panting and stamping their feet on the ground, creating loud cracks as the snow fell beneath them. Looking up, uncle had his finger straight on the bear spray trigger, ready to get them. Then the wolves ran right past us. They were maybe 10 feet away from us at most, moving so fast I could feel a small gust of wind push against my face. My uncle put down the bear spray and looked around, complete utter confusion encompassing his whole face. That's when I saw more glowing eyes. He motions his hand in a circle around him. There had to be dozens of critters and birds, running. They didn't even stop to look at us, they were just getting away. All the animals I had feared, all the critters and birds, and all sorts of things in the woods I had stared at in amazement just days before. All of them were running. I had never seen anything like it in my life, nor did my uncle. He decided that it was time to go, most likely because whatever the animals were running from was something that we didn't want to come across. Now my uncle was someone that doesn't get scared easily. From the stories your grandfather told me, he had faced death more times than he could count, coming across an angry grizzly, a hungry pack of wolves, and even someone pointing a gun at him. Even then, I didn't see fear in his face, but looking into his eyes, I could see worry, and that was all I needed to know. Our normal walk had turned into a jog, with uncle deciding that it would be faster to go off the trail through the woods. On the trail, there was a clear opening overhead for the light of the moon and stars to shine through but off trail, the pine needles blocked most of the light that came through, with small beams piercing the thick hide every so often. My uncle just kept walking straight towards the town. He probably just had half a mile left when he suddenly stopped, making me bump into his back. He didn't move, didn't even make a sound. Almost like he had stopped breathing. Hey, I asked in a squally voice. I looked ahead of him, my heart pounding against my sternum as it felt like a bicycle pump. Up ahead was the outline of a person, though it was too far away to see any facial features or any features at all. It was about 30 seconds before my uncle started backing up, gesturing me to do the same. Hello, can we help you? I heard it tremble. It was a small one, but it was enough to tell me everything I needed to know. My uncle, one of the coolest people I've ever known, was scared. Ever so slowly, my uncle put his hand behind his back, moving towards the bear spray but my eyes nearly popped out when his hand went past the bear spray and moved toward the gun. I heard a snapping sound. Up ahead I heard what sounded like a small twig break, and breaking eye contact with my uncle's hand, I looked forward back at the figure. He had taken a step forward, stepping on a small branch that poked out of the layer of snow, and with that step, there was a new feeling in the air. It wasn't the cold. It wasn't fear. It was hunger an almost lustful amount of it. Look, my uncle said, as his hand still gradually moved towards the desert eagle. We don't want any trouble. We're just trying to get back to town, so if you could please. He didn't get to finish his sentence. By this point my father stopped looking at me, instead looking out the window. It all happened too fast. First, there were the steps. Fast. Rampant. Each step came with a snarl. It was too fast for my uncle, too fast for me to process. What came next was the gunshot. It rang off the trees, bouncing back into my ears making them ring like a church bell. 
He got one shot off before it got to us. One shot off before it made him scream. It slammed into him, flinging both me and his gun to the left, slamming me on the ground with a loud thud which knocked the wind right out of me. Oh god, the screams. It didn't get him quickly. I didn't see it happen, but I heard the crunch of teeth going through and meeting bone. It probably stopped there for a second to savor the taste against its rotten teeth before it continued. I'm glad I didn't see it happen, but I could damn well hear it. Splish and splash as crimson was everywhere. Crunch after crunch came, followed by popping sounds. I don't know how long I had my eyes closed, but the sounds were inhuman. I opened them. I was facing away from them and looking at a light that bounced off a silver object. The Desert Eagle. I stood up, still shaken from the fall. The funny thing was I wasn't scared. My brain must have taken a hit, making it difficult for me to process what was happening behind me. I took a casual step forward, towards the gun, cracking the snow beneath my feet. And that's when the crunching stopped. That's when I remembered where I was. We both turned around at the same time. Its eyes met mine, if you could call them eyes. They were dark and hollow. Then there was the rest of its body. I couldn't believe the thing that did that to my uncle was unbelievably skinny. Its ribs poked out of its chest, bones clearly seen through its slender arms and legs. There were antlers that looked like that of a deer protruding from its head. He pauses and thinks for a moment. No, it wasn't a head. It was his skull. That's what it looked like, a skull with deer antlers coming from the top of its head. And even as it crouched I could see it was tall, even towering over me in that stance. We both stared at each other for what felt like hours, before it turned back around and continued getting what was left of my uncle. It didn't even care I was there. Why didn't it just attack me next, just get it over with? I didn't stop to ask these questions. I just turned, picked up the gun, and ran. For a second I considered firing, but I don't even think bullets affected this thing. All I knew was I had to get away, so I kept running. What probably took just ten minutes felt like an eternity. And then I saw the lights of the town. I'm gonna make it, I thought. Hope, creeping up my spine and into my brain. And that's when I heard the distant footsteps. I turned around for a split second and felt that hope come crashing down all the way to my toes. There it was, probably just 500 feet away. I could see its eyes. They weren't glowing or anything. They were just so dark they stood out, even at night. Now it was running fast. I couldn't believe my eyes. I would bet all the money I have, this thing could easily beat a gazelle. I turned my head back around and continued running, putting all my strength and energy into my legs to just get away from this thing. But the steps just kept getting closer. Now, I understand why it didn't get me before. Because it knew that no matter how much I tried to run, it would never fail to catch me. And all of the sudden, it did. A jolt of pain went through my entire leg when it clamped down. This thing had unimaginable strength to pick me up and flung me several dozen feet. I landed head first, shock and pain spreading throughout my entire body, but soon the pain was going away as I felt myself slipping away out of consciousness. In the background, I heard it crunching. This is it. This is how I'm going to go. I believed it, I truly did. But then I heard it. Get up. It was my uncle. You aren't going down that easy, are you? The words were all I needed. Every emotion in my body, hopelessness, fear, sadness, despair, were all replaced by one, rage. I turned around and pointed the weapon, which I managed to keep a hold of. It turned, seemingly shocked that I had a weapon in my hand, but soon after, it charged. I wasn't aiming for anything and fired. Almost seemingly in slow motion, I saw it fly and go straight into the void that was its eyes. Time stopped for just a second. Then it stumbled backward, grabbing its face. I then heard it scream. For the first time in the recording, I saw fear flicker in my father's eyes and then he continues. When I saw it open its mouth, I expected a monstrous bellow or a loud shriek. But what came out was worse. It wasn't the sound of a monster, but the sound of a people, hundreds of people, men and women screaming. But one scream remains in my mind forever. The only reason I can't ever forget what happened that day, I heard a specific scream come out of its mouth. The scream of my uncle. The rage was gone and the terror returned. I got back up and continued running towards the light. 
I didn't want to get away from it. I just wanted to get away from the horrible screaming. But I couldn't. I just couldn't. No matter how fast I ran, the dream stayed the same. But then it changed, for I was no longer screaming of pain, but screams of rage. I continued running. I had to get away. My leg was continuing to grow in pain as I continued running. My lungs went into overdrive, as my body demanded a huge amount of oxygen that my lungs could not provide. I remember bursting through the woods, welcomed by the bright street lamps and the hard pavement beneath my boots. When I had burst through out of the woods, my body had used up all its strength, and I fell. The last memory I got before blacking out was the screech of tires, a man looking over me on the phone. And before I lost consciousness, I turned my head and turned toward the woods. I saw it, standing there, one eye closed, staring at me. I didn't need to see its face to know what it felt. It was angry. And it was still hungry. I woke up the next day in the town's hospital. By that time, I had been out for three days. Your grandfather had flown over after he heard the news. I was greeted with his tears and his warm hug after he saw me awake. I told him and everyone else everything about the thing and uncle. They didn't believe me, probably thought the number of hits I took on my head made me imagine a bear as a monster. They did send out a search party. However, they didn't find it, but found what was left of uncle. The rumors spread. He sighs. That Wendigo is probably still out there, continuing to get innocent people, continuing to hate me for being the one that got away. And there's more out there, more that will not stop until they are full. And they are never full. And never will be. He pauses. The most disturbing thought I have is that of my uncle's voice in my head when that Wendigo had me on the ground. Sometimes I think, was it actually my uncle's voice telling me to get up? Or was it that thing telling me to get up, wanting me to put up a little more fight? I guess I'll never know. Excluding some tropical species, such as coconut and banana trees, no tree can survive long without branches. And yet, defying all explanation, I saw a pair of branchless oak trees in the summer of 2015. When I use the word branchless, I'm not referring to a stump or a tree that has shed its leaves during the winter. I'm talking about two 15-foot tall tree trunks, both sporting identical pointed peaks and surfaces of jagged bark. No branches or leaves, no severed branch stumps on the bark that would indicate the old oaks had ever been anything other than monolithic plants. Bizarre, I chuckled. Not necessarily riveting dinner talk, I know. Believe me, I wouldn't be recounting the tale if it had ended there. I chose to follow the overgrown footpath between the two pillars of bark, rather than the well-maintained public footpath, which led far away from the ominously bare trunks. I've always been an antagonist, so I suppose I wanted to satiate my hungry ego by taking the less trodden path. I'm no tourist, I inwardly scoffed. Hubris always comes before the fall, or, as my son would say, I had succumbed to main character energy. I wish I'd taken the popular path. I waded through leaves and moss, and the undergrowth crunched beneath my walking boots. I had no intended destination in mind. I was just looking for somewhere to set up my base camp. I knew how to retrace my steps. I saw no harm in taking a mystery trail. From time to time, I simply like to separate myself from the world. I venture on solo camping trips to clear my head. My wife and children don't take much interest in nature, so it's not that I purposefully exclude them. Frankly, I thank God that they weren't with me on this particular trip. Whilst camping in the middle of a clearing, I was awoken by rustling sounds outside my tent. I tried to ignore them, squeezing my eyelids together and angrily attempting to force myself back to sleep. Frustration quickly turned to fear. The noises that engulfed my tent were unlike any I'd ever heard. High-pitched squeals, similar to trainer souls squeaking against a hardwood floor, were emitted from every direction. Heart racing at a tremendous pace, I sat upright and stared at the fragile wall of material that was separating me from whatever unidentifiable things were out there. Very little moonlight reached the clearing. Thankfully, so the shadows that danced on the outer fabric of my tent were indistinguishable. That made it easier to tell myself the creatures were simply foxes. They were not foxes. I knew that. I used string to build a makeshift lock for the zipper on my tent. 
I didn't want anything opening the door to my vulnerable fortress. After that, I lay down and waited. The piercing yipping noises eventually quieted down, but I didn't immediately fall asleep. I intended to stay awake all night, but I must have eventually passed out. I think terror can do that to a person. In the morning, I planned to leave the haunting woods and go home. You can imagine my horror when I unlocked my tent door and found that I was no longer in the forest clearing. My tent had been moved whilst I slept. More horrifyingly than that, I found myself stuck in a thick cluster of branchless trees. As far as the eye could see, I was surrounded by those eerily raw oak trunks. I instantly packed my tent and belongings. I weaved between the densely packed trees of the new branchless forest in which I found myself. No luck. I'd completely lost my bearings. I had no idea where I'd been taken. The branchless forest was the same in every direction. All I could see was endless bark. And, when the sun began to fall below the tip of the treetops, I realized I'd let the wintry day slip away from me. Night was approaching quickly, but that wasn't what terrified me most. The horrid squeals had returned. As the sun dipped lower and lower, the squeals multiplied and loudened. Before long, the sound was accompanied by rustling bushes. Panic turned me to stone. My walking slowed, and I started to believe I would never leave the forest. I was unbelievably happy when I found the stream. My saving grace. I couldn't find it on my map, but I didn't have time to think about the horrifying implications of that fact. Every stream has to lead somewhere, even in a dense landscape of alien trees. I had no idea which way to walk, so I followed the stream east. Trying fervently to ignore the cacophony of squeals and rustling shrubbery, I pressed onwards. I was stumbling around in complete darkness at this point, guided only by the dim light of my cheap torch. After an hour of walking, I finally found something promising. A cave. I didn't plan on entering it, but I welcomed any sort of landmark that could break the monotony of ceaseless tree trunks. My victorious moment was short-lived, however, as I was interrupted by small, pattering sounds from behind me. I quivered as I twisted around and moved my torchlight towards the source of the sound, finding myself gazing upon a terrifying gaggle of two dozen tiny humanoid creatures. Each one was about 30 centimeters tall, had two ant-like feelers, in lieu of eyes, and brandished a ghoulish set of black fangs. Each one also had four vaguely human arms, along with two vaguely human legs. As they walked towards me, they dropped forwards and used all six limbs to scurry like insects. I backed away incredibly slowly, almost too petrified to move. My torch shook violently in my near-numb hand. In a flood of sound and a flash of rapid movement, one of the fiendish things charged from my leg and made quick work of snaking around it. I screamed as the creature began to constrict my limb, cutting off its circulation. The creature's friends released a chorus of seemingly jubilant squeals. I didn't wait for the others to join their brave leader. I ferociously punted the transiting creature with the rear end of my torch, and it hissed in pain, uncoiling from my leg. Body shaking in horror, I seized my small window of opportunity and started sprinting towards the cave mouth. The six limbed monstrosities pursued me, rapidly closing the gap between us. I expected them to devour me in the entrance to the black chasm I was approaching. They didn't. As I fell into the nothingness of the cave, I turned around to look at the now stationary group of horrifying ant people. They were just standing at the entrance of the cave and watching. It was as if they were too afraid to step inside, and I really should have paid more attention to that. A hiss, like a sand timer being flipped upside down, erupted from the deepest point of the cavernous pit. I shuddered, but I realized I had two options. I could either face certain death from the ant people at the door to the cave, or I could risk whatever lay in Whitbeat. There wasn't really a choice, but I chose the latter. My torch barely illuminated the few yards in front of me, so I was mostly wandering in pitch blackness. The hissing creature was suddenly entirely silent. The only sound in the cave was that of my echoing footsteps. Even the ant people had ceased their squealing. What did they fear in the heart of that dreadful place? That was when I saw it. The cave itself was not particularly big. It was more of a room than a home, and I stumbled into the room of the ghastliest thing I've ever seen. The ant people paled in comparison. My torchlight could scarcely do justice to the enormous being before me. In the very far corner of the cave, about 100 feet from the entrance, was a 10-foot-tall insect. 
Actually, no, I don't think it was an insect. Much like the ant people, it possessed some characteristics of certain insects and arachnoids, but this creature was a beast unto its own. The thing was essentially just six hairless legs, similar to those of a human, other than the length and the pointed ends, instead of feet. At first glance, it seemed like a spider with two missing limbs, but I quickly ascertained that the creature had no discernible body. Its body was its legs. The thing had no head. Its six limbs met at a central point, but there was no indication of any torso that would contain organs or sensory tools. Yet, the creature certainly lived, and it certainly sensed me. Its horrifying six legs started to tentatively crawl towards the source of the torch light. I wasn't going to wait around for another monster to seize my body and devour it. I scanned the walls of the cave, looking for a hiding spot. In the other back corner, there was a cluster of rocks. If I could just crawl in there, I might be out of reach, I thought. I sprinted at a speed I didn't know I could reach. The six-legged thing hurtled after me, its limbs making a horrific clicking sound as they galloped across the stones beneath them. Diving for a gap behind the rocks, I crawled out of reach and put my torch light onto the creature which lay beyond my rocky fortress. The thing unleashed a menacing howl and proceeded to jab the sharp ends of its fleshy limbs at the holes between the rocks. Fortunately, the rocks shielded me, but the wait until sunrise was unbearably long. As daylight began to fill the cave, I squinted through the cracks in my rocky wall, and I was fairly certain the ant people had vanished. I had a plan, but I only had one shot at making it work. Searching in my rucksack, I found what I needed. A flare. I just had to hope it would scare away the six-legged thing that was valiantly attempting to turn me into minced meat. Not pausing to make any more plans or rethink my decision, I lit up the flare. It worked. The creature wailed in terror, backing away into its original corner of the cave to escape the scorching blaze of the flare in my hand. I hurriedly scrambled free of the rocky fortress, keeping the flare in front of me, and I ran to the entrance of the creature's den. I was determined not to spend another day in that nightmarish forest. I followed the stream the other way. After hours and hours of walking, I finally found something that briefly stifled the fear in my heart. I found trees with branches and leaves. Recognizing my surroundings, I managed to retrace my steps and find the original overgrown path that I followed through the two branchless trees. The trees that started that mess. I've never talked about this incident to anyone. I couldn't find that forest of branchless trees, the stream, or the cave on any map. I don't know how I stumbled upon it. I don't know how I escaped from it. I only know one thing. If you ever see a branchless oak tree, walk away. I've always loved birds. Going on hikes, pointing them out to my family, they've always been such fun creatures. Every winter break, my family sends me to my Uncle Jack's little cabin with my notebook so I can take a break from high school. They never let me keep my phone, and anytime anything comes up, I notify him immediately. Sounds like a terrible idea, right? I've been doing this for a few years now, and luckily, nothing bad has happened. Well, until this one. For reference, my uncle is the strongest and smartest man you'll ever meet. Retired soldier, at least three medals won for his courage, you know the type. If he was dropped in a rainforest for a week he'd survive by drinking python venom and spearing for piranhas. If you whipped out a phone in front of him, he would point out every little thing and ask about it. I love him to bits. We're both a little estranged with our families, so he became like a second father to me. He lives in a quaint little cabin in some Washington rainforest. There's a single dirt road that you exit onto when you leave the highway, and after maybe an hour, you'll arrive at his little wooden home. My aunt passed away a few years ago, which I think is why my mom always sends me to his house. And so she did. As I played games on my phone in the backseat, my mom looked a little distressed as she drove through the dirt path. Apparently, my uncle had been acting a little odd, which she chalked up to old age. But she knew her brother well, and it was the first sign that things wouldn't go how I'd hoped. He was normal when we first arrived, and for a good few days things were just as they should have been. My uncle would enforce a curfew strictly at 9 before pulling me out of my bed at 6 in the morning. I would watch birds on hikes and draw them in my notebook while my uncle told jokes about the marines. 
I had heard them a thousand times before, of course, but just the sound of my uncle's voice was pleasant. It wasn't until the fourth day of my week-long trip that I noticed what my mom was talking about. He would mutter under his breath, stare at the sky at night when he thought I wasn't looking. And for my uncle, silence was rare. His hearty laughter and confident demeanor were noticeably missing throughout the day. By the time the sun was setting, my uncle changed the curfew to six. There would be no leaving the house after the sun had set. Even though he was usually strict, he had never missed out on cooking s'mores while playing his banjo by the campfire. Not once. That night, as I read my book under my flashlight, I glanced out the window only to see a pair of bright eyes staring right back at me. I knew it was wildlife, but my uncle's behavior had made me a little edgy. The next day when I asked about it, he told me that it was a fox and that their eyes would shine an ominous red at night. It wasn't for a few days until I remembered that foxes didn't live in this area of Washington. The next day, my uncle looked visibly nervous. He told me that he would be going hunting and he wouldn't be back until evening. There were cheese crackers in the pantry if I got hungry, he would be back soon, don't go out too far until he gets back, the usual. At this point, I was extremely nervous, alone to watch over his cabin. After he left, I looked around a little. This feeling, this horrible unease that I was somehow being watched creeped into my soul. This wasn't a prank. The only pranks my uncle had ever done were filling my shoes with dirt and letting a spider loose in my bed sheets. I knew I was alone, but the feeling wouldn't go away. After looking around for a bit, in the same spot where I had seen the eyes last night were tracks. Human tracks. Two bare footprints in the dirt. My uncle didn't come back that night. I've only pulled three all-nighters without sleep, and that was one of them. I stayed awake my whole night with my curtains drawn, too afraid to see what might be watching on the other side. I hid underneath my covers, the wind howling outside. I was comforted by the fact that if something was outside, it would be suffering in the 20 degree windy weather. I spent the whole day reading, too afraid to go out, my stomach slightly woozy from the diet of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with crackers. By nighttime, my uncle still hadn't come back. The next day, my mom would come to pick me up, but sadly, that isn't all that happened. I remember exactly how the night went. At maybe 10 at night, I heard a knock on the door. My uncle kept a key underneath the frayed welcome mat. He never knocked. His boisterous self wouldn't let him knock on the door of his own house. Silently, I made my way to my bathroom, locking the door behind me, making sure that there weren't any windows in it. I was clutching an aluminum bat that my uncle never used for the vague hope that if someone, or something, got into the house, I could defend myself. The knocking got more violent, something was slamming on the door. Then, as abruptly as it started, it stopped. Then, I heard it again. This time, it was on the other side of the house. Glass shattering. A loud thud. My heart was pumping. I turned off the light in the bathroom as footsteps creaked on the floorboards outside. It walked right by my door, a shadow blocking the light from filtering in the bottom of the doorframe. I knew better than to make noise. They hung around for a good few hours. My adrenaline wore out after a while, with just pure fear remaining. If only my uncle was there. Luckily, I had turned off the light in my room. There was nothing that signified I was in the house, but I still held my breath until they scampered back out the window. At least, that was what it sounded like. I didn't take the risk of leaving. I slept in the bathtub that night. The next morning, I woke up to my mom yelling and knocking on the door. Opening the bathroom door, the floor was covered in red liquid. A trail of sticky crimson, still damp on the wooden floor. I nearly threw up, running to the door. My mom stood in front of me, enraged at how I hadn't responded. Where was Uncle Jack? Why did I sleep in so late? I just hugged her, sobbing. I didn't know what happened. Or why. She pretty quickly realized that things weren't normal. After taking a look inside the cabin, she called the local police. I still remember the cold interrogation room. Where was I that night? What happened to my uncle? Whose blood was on the floor? I answered everything honestly, my eyes blurred with tears and my nose clumped with snot. It was horrible. I was dismissed as a suspect. I think they felt bad for me, crying my eyes out in front of them. It's been a year. After multiple searches, none of the local authorities could find my uncle. He was well and truly gone. His house got shut down. 
I spent this winter break at home, remembering what happened. I don't think I'll ever forget my Uncle Jack and his cabin in the woods. And I don't think I'll ever truly know what happened in that forest. Maybe it's better that way. I don't think I want to know what happened that night. My life is boring. I'm a student at a boring university in a boring town. In my free time, I usually sit in my tiny boring student room with my boring computer, having to listen to my boring roommate and her boring boyfriend's loud conversations. For a long while, I have felt that my life is too routine. I do the same boring crap every single day. I felt a need for more excitement in my life. Since I was 15 I have always been interested in places that most people do not really know of. Places that have stood abandoned for many years. Places that, if you enter them, you stand the risk of getting arrested. Reading about these places on Reddit always excited me. I wanted to go to them, I wanted the adrenaline and fear that came with them. Watching other people on YouTube exploring old hotels, warehouses, malls or even bowling alleys made me jealous. I watched people getting chased by dogs or cops, people finding creepy items or encountering homeless addicts, and that only made me want to visit an abandoned place more. Because my life was so boring, the adrenaline was very alluring to me, and so I did some research. I had only been a student at my university for a couple of months. I was in a new town with new places to explore. After doing some googling I found out that there in fact was an abandoned place where I live, not too far from me. Of course, I was intrigued. I needed to spice up my life, and unlike other people my age I did not want to do that by partying or hooking up. I wanted to spice my life up by adding some danger to it. From what I read the place did not seem that special. It was not an entire hotel or some mall. It was only an old underground tunnel that used to be a passage for car traffic. It felt like the perfect place for a beginner to explore. It had not been in use for over 20 years, and it seemed that not that many urban explorers had been there before me. I have some friends but none of them would ever be interested in putting themselves in danger just to seek some thrill. My friends are the kind of people who like to sit in a circle while drinking and playing games. That can be fun, of course, but it is not very exciting. So, I went alone. Stupid decision, I know. I am a young and short female who decided to go to an abandoned place after dark on my own. I was naive and thought that nothing could ever happen to me, but something did. And after my experience, you best believe that I will not explore alone, or at all, ever again. It was a weekend night when I decided to take my bike and go to the tunnel. With me, I brought a flashlight, an army knife, pepper spray and my camera. At least I brought some protection, right? But that did not help me from getting traumatized, maybe for life. It had already gotten dark out and before leaving I checked the time on my computer monitor. It was 22.04, so not that late. This was during autumn though, so the natural light had run out for the day. I left my room and locked the door after me. My roommate is a nice girl but I don't fully trust her yet, hence locking it. When I left she had the door to her room open, as always, and therefore saw me leaving. I did not tell her where I was going, only that I was taking a walk. Once I got out of my apartment building I unlocked my bike and started my journey towards the tunnel. I had found the coordinates online and was finding my way to them with the help of Google Maps on my phone. To get there, I had to bike through a wooded area. The path was not lit up, the only reason that I could see anything was because of my bike light. It was scary, but I enjoyed the fear. At least I was feeling something. I thought it was great, I already felt more alive and I had not even reached my destination yet. Suddenly, my GPS said to turn left, into the woods. It would have been impossible to take my bike because there was no path and the terrain did not seem friendly. Therefore, I left my bike on the path and locked it. I turned my bike light off and suddenly, I was standing in complete darkness. The only sound was the wind blowing the leaves and some ruffling of trees from a deer or something. I took a deep breath and turned on the flashlight that I had brought with me. It was a cheap flashlight, and the light it emitted was far from satisfactory. I could really only see a couple of meters in front of me. Nothing scary had really happened yet but I still felt uneasy. I started to regret coming there but thought that I might as well get to the tunnel. Quickly, I started to make my way through the forest. I felt scared and sort of observed. 
In reality, I knew that no one was out there. It was half past ten at night in the middle of the forest on a weekend. No one was crazy enough to take a stroll at this time, except for me I guess. Eventually, I reached the tunnel. If I wasn't scared before, I definitely was now. The inside of the tunnel was dark and seemed to go on forever. The outside was covered with demonic symbols and, of course, weird objects spray painted on the wall. Above the tunnel, someone had written stay out or be ended in red paint. None of this made me want to leave though. I just figured that some bored teenagers from the town had painted it all. To be fair, there was not a lot to do around here. With that, I entered the tunnel. The ground in there was slightly damp and I could hear dripping sounds around me. Stupidly enough I was wearing sneakers and the dirty liquid from the ground made them soaked right away. I still kept going, I would just clean the shoes later. The graffiti from outside the tunnel continued on the tunnel walls with more cryptic symbols and warnings. I kept going knowing that this was something that was common in abandoned places. The tunnel was not that interesting, to be honest. Sure, it was thrilling being there at night, but there were not a lot of things to discover. A pit started to form in my stomach. I did not really know why, nothing had happened to make me scared but something just did not feel right. I shine my light on one of the tunnel walls and immediately jumped back and, I am embarrassed to say, let out a high-pitched scream which echoed through the tunnel. I thought I had seen a ghost or something, but after looking at the wall I could see that it was just a demonic looking face painted on there. I chuckled a little to myself, how could something so stupid have scared me like that? I must have really been on edge. My momentary relief was quickly gone when I shined my flashlight on the ground in front of the face. There, on the ground, I could see some dirty blankets and a pillow. At the time I couldn't understand why it was there, but it definitely freaked me out a bit. Was someone living in this tunnel? I started to feel very uneasy again and wanted to leave. I took a photo of the face and the bed, just to document that I had been there, and started to walk towards the exit. That is when I heard footsteps coming into the tunnel. That was scary enough, but what made it worse was that they came from the direction I had come from. The direction which was my way out. I froze for a second, not knowing what to do. Eventually, before the person could get any closer, I snapped out of my haze and started running the other way, further into the tunnel. This seemed like my best option at the time, and knowing what I know now I can confirm that it was. When I started running, so did the other person. I could hear the footsteps speeding up behind me. While running I started to take my army knife out of my pocket. I know that running with a knife in itself is dangerous, but at least I could protect myself if the person caught up to me. The tunnel was not as long as I thought and eventually, I reached its other end. In my panicked state, I had not noticed that the footsteps behind me had prevailed. But once I had left the tunnel, I noticed it. Still, I kept running. At that moment I thought that I had to get back to my bike, so I started going through the forest, running beside the hill which the tunnel went through. During my run, at various moments, I could swear that I heard branches breaking around me. It might have been paranoia though because it would not have been possible for the person to catch up to me at this point. When I found the path where my bike stood again, I felt a small sense of relief. Once I reached the bike, I quickly unlocked it and raced home. Not until I reached my apartment building did I start to calm down slightly. That is when I noticed a note in my bicycle basket. I put my bike away and ran into my dorm room with the note in hand. Once I had locked the door behind me, I sat down. I was still in a state of shock at this point. Had someone really just chased me? Why did I put myself in such danger? Slowly I opened up the note. The contents of it was short but terrifying. Hello pretty girl, I have not met you yet, but I am excited to do so. The fact that this was left in my bicycle basket means that this person must have been somewhere in the forest, observing me while I left my bike. If not, how did they know that I was a girl? The note was not exactly threatening, but with context it was definitely yarring. This person had been by themselves, in the forest at night, observing me and then following me. Thank god I noticed their footsteps in time, otherwise I might not have been writing this right now. I still don't know who chased me that night, and I will not be going back to find out. I assume that the person who chased me is the same person who lives in the tunnel. Just think about what kind of state you must be in to find shelter in such a place. Either this person was on drugs or in a very bad mental state, probably both.
After this experience, I am definitely not going anywhere by myself at night. And to the person who might be reading this, do not go to abandoned places alone. No matter how thrilling or enticing it might seem, it is not worth the risks. I don't know how long it's been, I don't remember when we left. Only that we've been on this rafting trip too long. A little background, me and my friend Milo have been rafting and camping on a very rural stretch of river for days. We haven't seen another person in so long. A few days ago, I stepped out of my tent and saw Milo standing by the river bank. I started to walk over to him but for some reason I felt I shouldn't. Something about him was wrong. I stepped back and relieved myself on a tree. I watched him for a while, but he never moved. I figured he just couldn't sleep and went back into my tent. The next day he had huge purple bags under his red eyes. I attempted conversation a few times but he murmured something unintelligible and I left him alone. I started to load up the boats with our gear, but he just sat there, gently rocking back and forth. Hey Milo, we're about to head out. The boats are set. He slowly turned his head to look at me, like a deranged asylum patient in a movie. Leave me here. He must be joking, I thought. Nah come on man, all your stuff is on green. Green was the name of his worn raft, it was a faded olive color. I don't need it, he said, eerily calm as he turned back towards the forest. Milo you're being a weirdo, let's go, I laughed nervously. Suddenly he whipped his head around and screeched at me in this voice I had never heard him use. I said to leave me here. I was legitimately scared at this point, this was nothing like him. Okay dude chill. I'll take off on mine, meet me at campsite 3. He stared at me. Those horrible eyes pierced my soul. No response. See you later, I said as I pushed my raft into the brown swirling water. I hopped on and drifted down the river, away from the island where I left him. I spent two nights at that place before I went back for Milo. I never should have done that. After a full day of paddling upstream I was mad and my arms hurt, but I was at the island. Milo, I yelled, searching warily. I heard heavy ragged breathing in some bush, like a dying animal. Him Milo, is that you buddy? I asked softly, peeling away branches. A hand rushed out of the branches and grabbed me with a strong grip. The skin was pale and covered in cuts and dried scabs, the skin stretched over painfully. He wheezed at me. Stay here. I tried to jump back. What the hell man? Let go. His grip weakens and the hand slid off of me. Don't resist it. Stay. I freaked out and ran towards the bank, but the lazy stretch of river I had traveled on before was now flowing rapidly, dragging our boats with it. No. I screamed, collapsing to the ground. The black waves seemed jagged as they lapped at my feet, reflecting the distant starlight. I hadn't even noticed the sun go down. It seemed like it was evening just seconds ago. No. I'm screwed. I paced along the bank, reluctant to go into the forest again. I finally settled on a spot by the tree I had previously set up a tent next to. I was just closing my eyes when I heard uneven footsteps and that same ragged breathing. It was him. Everything about him was, I don't know how to describe it. He staggered to the bank, and out of the swirling water a creature rose. Its horrifying head broke the surface and slowly came towards Milo. It drew itself higher out of the water. Its glowing blank eyes were set deep into its head, like round white pearls that lost their shine centuries ago. It looked like a huge eel almost, with moist skin so dark it seemed to suck light out from around it. Its slightly open mouth was filled with thin needle-like teeth, transparent and an uneven rose along its long jaw. It had a glowing sort of lantern hanging from its chin, as big as a human's head, and more glowing spots along the sides of its ridiculously gigantic neck. Milo walked towards it. I wanted to scream but the breath wouldn't leave my frantically fluttering lungs. After Milo's head submerged the creature sank back down into the river, following him. I don't know what happened, but the whispers started a few hours ago. The whispers haven't stopped. It has been a day. I don't remember when they started. I think I'm going insane. The whispers. They sound so inviting. I am going into the river tonight. Any fate is better than this. Goodbye.
This is a true story, and it haunts me every single night. It all started on a Tuesday night around 2 in the morning. I'm lying alone in bed in the dark, and my window is cracked open. I prefer having a breeze at night to stay cool. I open my window every single night. It doesn't matter if it's hot or cold or windy or rainy, I will open my window. Anyways, I had to make this post because it is really haunting me. To explain, all of a sudden the noise started. I remember my eyes rapidly opening and the shivers being brought down my spine. It was very paralyzing and it made my whole body jolt like a shockwave running through my nerves. This sensation is especially intense at night when you are startled by a noise like your old house resting. But this was unlike anything I've ever experienced. To start, the noise that scared me seemed to be a man shouting from a quarter of a mile away. I thought to myself that this was extremely unusual. I live in a desolate area and I don't have many neighbors around, so it couldn't have been them. I live in a woodsy area in a humble neighborhood. Most people who live here are hermits and don't leave their homes unless it's for bi-weekly grocery shopping or leaving in the morning to go to work. But the screams were very specific and were arranged in a pattern. They almost sounded inhuman. A loud but faint yell would sound about every two seconds and the yells were unintelligible words and lasted for about one to two syllables. It was almost perfect sounding like a recording of a shout played again and again and again but for hours. The dreadful sound stayed in place for three hours of non-stop yelling and the man never seemed to move locations except for when the noises slowly got farther away and that's when it seemed to stop. The sounds lasted from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. I assume the man making the disturbance is in his early 30s. It haunts me to think of someone just standing in the forest blatantly yelling words for three hours straight in the middle of the night. The sounds didn't appear like they were desperate as if they were in need of any help. The only drastic thing would be if a bear mauled you to death, but no one's stupid enough to go out at night like this. The shouts sounded emotionless and of course very terrifying. I eventually was able to catch my breath and peek out the window. It wasn't the wind causing the noise and most definitely wasn't a branch scraping my window like someone would try claiming in order to debunk me. But I was too afraid to go outside and investigate. I had to debate whether calling the police would be the right thing to do or not. I'm a short woman and I'm not the absolute strongest and I know if I investigated on my own, I would be the avid kidnapping victim. From watching and reading horror stories, I know the person who investigates always dies in the end. I kept my ear close to the window for a few minutes and I was starting to decrypt what he was saying. It sounded like it was in a different language or a gibberish word being spoken but it was very strange. I know I'm not crazy and I know what I heard. I will probably never open my window ever again since I don't want to find out who or what was making those sounds and I definitely do not want them to come back. Does anyone know what this could be? I asked my neighbors if they heard and only one out of four claimed they did. We both don't know what it was. It was a day like any other, the Wyoming sun piercing down on us, when Victor and I set out to add another member to our family. His hand, warm in mine, matched the heat of our shared enthusiasm. We didn't need much. We already had our three dogs a lively bunch composed of my Welsh Terriers Goldie and Teddy and Victor's miniature poodle Fifi. But there was an unspoken agreement between us. Room for one more. We drove to the local shelter. The drive was scenic, open plains stretched out on either side, interrupted occasionally by scrubby pines. Buster, Ace, Milo, Victor mused, his eyes twinkling in amusement. I smiled back at him, a sense of shared comfort lacing the silence that ensued. The shelter was bustling with activity. Yips and barks filled the air, a symphony of canine voices that were both desperate and hopeful. It was in this cacophony that we first saw Joey. He was hunched in the corner of his cage, a one-year-old English Mastiff mix. He was a mountain of a dog, his frame significantly bigger than the rest. His previous owners hadn't expected him to grow so big and couldn't keep him. Joey, despite his size, looked at us with tender brown eyes, a gentle giant, I felt a slight twinge of apprehension as we approached him. Joey towered over me, a contrast to our smaller, playful dogs back at home. But one look at Victor's enamored expression, and I knew there was no turning back. As I reached out tentatively to pet Joey, I noticed his eyes flicker. From the brown, they turned a deep, mesmerizing blue. 
I blinked, disoriented, but when I looked again, they were brown as before. On our way home, Joey sat in the back seat, his head resting against the window. His size was commanding, but he seemed docile, content even. I told myself the changing eye colors had been a trick of the light, a momentary illusion. Yet a small part of me continued to harbor doubts. We introduced Joey to Goldie, Teddy, and Fifi as soon as we got home. Fifi, a normally spunky dog, growled low in her throat and slunk behind the couch. Joey seemed taken aback by her hostility, his expression one of perplexed confusion. The other dogs didn't seem to mind him. I brushed it off as Fifi needing time to adjust. That night, Victor and I sat on the porch, staring out into the open Wyoming night. We raised our beers in a silent toast to our new addition, while my mind kept returning to the scene at the shelter, to Joey's eyes shifting from brown to blue. I told myself it was nothing, just the stress of the day playing tricks on me. I should have known then that there's always more to it when it comes to dogs, especially one like Joey. In the days that followed Joey's adoption, I grew accustomed to the rhythm of our expanded family. The morning sun shone through our windows, our home bustled with activity, and the days were as lively as ever. But something about Joey set me on edge. There was an underlying current of… weirdness. At first it was Fifi. Poor girl couldn't seem to catch a break. She hid in the oddest places, under the bed, behind the couch, even once in the laundry hamper. She was a trembling bundle of nerves every time Joey was around. The strange part was Joey's reaction, pure bewilderment. It was as if he couldn't understand why she was so terrified. Then, there were the nights. They say you're never truly alone when you have dogs, and boy, I couldn't agree more. It started with me waking up to Fifi's low whimpers and finding Joey standing near her hiding places. There was an unsettling rhythm to these occurrences that disrupted the serenity of our Wyoming nights. One evening, as I brushed past a hallway mirror, I noticed something that sent a chill down my spine. Joey, standing behind me, bared his teeth at Fifi, his eyes gleaming menacingly in the mirror. I spun around, my heart pounding, but found Joey sitting calmly on the floor, his tail wagging gently. Victor thought I was overreacting when I brought up my concerns. Joey's a big teddy bear, he'd say. You're just being paranoid. I wanted to believe him, I truly did, but I couldn't ignore the dread that lingered whenever Joey was around. The unease in the house prompted me to move Joey to the kitchen during the night. That's when the strangest thing happened. Every morning we'd wake up to find our food spoiled as if left out overnight. It was as if someone, or something, had rummaged through our fridge. As I held the rotten food, Joey would stare back at me his eyes full of a challenge that made my skin crawl. I thought moving Joey to the backyard would end these occurrences. But the bizarre incidents took a darker turn. Every morning, I'd find dead animals scattered across our lawn. Their bodies were mangled, organs missing, as if expertly removed. Victor was oblivious, always at work before dawn, but I was there, cleaning up the grotesque mess left behind. When I confronted Joey about it, he snarled at me a low, threatening sound that had my heart pounding in my chest. I'd never seen him so aggressive, not even with Fifi. My fears were escalating, and Victor, caught in his world of denial, refused to see what was happening. The Wyoming sun continued to shine, the open plains continued to stretch out, but my world was slowly closing in. I felt trapped in my own home, my fears punctuated by Joey's increasing hostility and the unnerving incidents. My mind kept going back to that day at the shelter, when Joey's eyes shifted from brown to blue. I had a feeling that something terrible was about to happen, and it had everything to do with Joey. In the shadowy quiet of Wyoming nights, a sense of dread took root within me. I felt myself being pulled into a horror I could neither comprehend nor ignore. Our home, once a sanctuary, now teemed with unseen fears, their form given substance by Joey. I tried talking to Victor about Joey about the things I'd noticed. Victor's bond with Fifi was special. She belonged to his sister who, along with her other dog, had died in a car crash weeks before we met. Victor had a soft spot for the poodle, and I hoped my concerns would make him reconsider Joey. But he shot me down, his face hardened with anger. He couldn't bear to think his beloved Joey could hurt Fifi, and I didn't have the heart to push it any further. One night, 
I awoke to a blood-curdling scream. It was Fifi. Heart pounding, I rushed downstairs to find Joey in the living room. The sight that met my eyes was something out of a nightmare. Joey was tearing Fifi apart. I screamed for Victor, tears blurring my vision as I took in the horror unfolding before me. Victor came rushing in, his face pale. He switched on the lights, and it wasn't real. Fifi was safe, hiding under the couch, her body shaking with terror. The remains on the floor were that of a stuffed toy, not Fifi. But I couldn't shake the image from my mind. Joey, his mouth smeared with blood. Victor berated me for my panic, for my accusations against Joey. But all I could focus on were Joey's eyes, soulless, gleaming with a sinister satisfaction that had my blood running cold. My fears escalated to a point where I couldn't take it anymore. My once peaceful home was now a battlefield, my dreams haunted by visions of Fifi's death and Joey's monstrous form. I was trapped in my own nightmare. Then, one night, the unthinkable happened. I awoke to a grotesque figure looming over me. Its limbs were twisted, its body distorted, its eyes a piercing blue. It was a creature straight out of hell, and I knew it was Joey. I woke Victor up, fear clawing at my throat. But by the time Victor blinked his eyes open, Joey was back in his dog form, looking as innocent as ever. Victor dismissed my fears with a shake of his head and fell back asleep. But I knew better. I'd seen Joey for what he truly was. The next morning, I woke up to an unexpected surprise. Victor had planned a weekend getaway. We hurriedly packed our bags, leaving Joey behind with a friend of ours. As we drove off, I felt a sense of relief wash over me. For the first time since we'd brought Joey home, I felt safe. But as I glanced in the rearview mirror, I saw Joey standing in our driveway, his eyes gleaming a sinister blue. My heart pounded in my chest. Something told me this was far from over. As we drove further away from home, the verdant plains of Wyoming seemed to lighten my mood. We were heading towards a destination where the echoing growls of a beast were no longer part of my nightmares, but the lingering dread in the back of my mind persisted. About fifty miles away from home, Victor broke the silence. His voice was low, his words delivered with a heaviness that made my heart sink. He'd seen Joey too, that night, standing over us in his grotesque form. He'd played down his reaction but the sight had shaken him as much as it had me. I was silent, processing his confession. Victor had called an animal rescue team instead of our friend. He'd lied about Joey being aggressive and uncontrollable. They were going to put Joey down. The guilt etched on Victor's face was clear. He'd seen what I'd seen, felt what I'd felt. He'd just been too afraid to admit it. We took refuge at my parents' house, our home now tainted by an inexplicable fear. We were safe, but the haunting image of Joey, in his true form, lingered in my mind. I wasn't sure we'd ever feel comfortable in our house again. One evening while Victor was outside talking to my dad, I decided to check on Goldie and Teddy. As I walked towards the room where they were resting, a familiar fear clutched my heart. I heard a growl, low and menacing, sending a shiver down my spine. I pushed open the door, my breath hitching as I took in the scene before me. Goldie and Teddy were huddled in a corner, their eyes wide with fear. Fifi was nowhere to be seen, and in the middle of the room, a large, twisted figure stood. Its eyes met mine, gleaming a chilling blue. Joey. A wave of terror swept over me, my blood running cold. Joey was supposed to be gone, he was supposed to be dead, but there he was, standing in front of me, in his grotesque, monstrous form. A growl echoed through the room a sound so terrifying it froze me in my tracks. And then, a blink of an eye, he was gone. The room was empty, save for Goldie and Teddy. There was no sign of Joey or Fifi. It was as if he'd never been there, but the terror in the dog's eyes told me otherwise. Joey was back, and he was far from done. The Wyoming nights had taken on a new form of terror, the looming threat of Joey hanging over us like a dark cloud. We thought we had escaped, thought we were safe, but we were wrong. I looked out the window, the moonlight casting long shadows across the yard. I could almost see him there, Joey, his eyes glowing with an unnatural blue. We had only just begun to understand the nightmare we'd invited into our home. From when I was born up until four months ago, my family of four lived in Nowheresville, Indiana. The town consisted of exactly 37 streets, 
one school covering kindergarten to 12th grade, one three-story hospital, exactly two pizza places, and fewer than 6,000 people. We were well off, owning a large three-story house right next to the school, but I always got the sense that my parents were uneasy, specifically my father. He would go on month-long business trips to who knows where three or four times a year, and he always seemed the happiest a few days before leaving. At around the age of nine, I came to the conclusion that if his family wasn't here, he would be living in some metropolis at least five states away. He always seemed partial to New York. We'd been there a few times and he was always more energetic than I'd ever seen him, dragging us from the Statue of Liberty to the One World Trade Center to the top of the Empire State. Then after at most a week, we would return to the land of everybody knowing everybody and a plethora of old white men sitting on their porches in their rocking chairs, sipping Arnold Palmers and waving as you pass. For some people, a paradise, a retirement village if there ever was one, but for my father, purgatory. The first incident happened at exactly 2.32 a.m. I was hunkered down in my room, blanket draped over my back, illuminated by the glow of some horror movie. I can't recall precisely what it was, perhaps The Exorcist, or maybe Omen. I've loved horror movies since I was old enough to get my hands on them, and I've seen all the classics. I know the legend of Jason Voorhees, which scared me into quitting sleepaway camp. I fear the dream demon Freddy Krueger, which made me pull two consecutive all-nighters until I collapsed in the middle of history from pure exhaustion. Michael Myers stopped me from trick-or-treating one Halloween, and Pennywise keeps me at least five feet from a storm drain to this day. Yet for all their downsides, I couldn't tear my eyes away. Something about the monsters, be they human, ghost, zombie, or killer clown, always drew me back. So I was up late into the night when I heard the whistling first. It jarred me when it started, and I paused the movie for a moment before forgetting about it. It was a jaunty tune, cheerful yet erratic. It never repeated itself, and despite its upbeat nature, something about it was off-putting. Yet someone whistling, albeit late at night, was no cause for alarm. However, as the movie progressed and I drew the covers tighter around my skinny frame, the sound persisted. After five minutes I paused the movie again to listen. It was coming from the same general location, yet the direction of the sound shifted ever so slightly, as if the whistler was pacing. It couldn't have been more than twenty feet from my house, but when I checked my second floor window, it instantly ceased. There was nothing except a spindly sapling sitting blocking my view, yet I saw no one. I sat at the window for a minute or two, but nothing. I didn't think much of it and finished my movie, then collapsed into a nightmare-filled sleep. The next evening was much of the same. The movie playing out on the screen this time was a personal favorite of mine, Paranormal Activity. And during a quiet, tense scene about two-thirds of the way in, the clock struck 2.32 and the whistling began again. I instantly shut off the TV and grabbed my phone, clicking on its flashlight. The tune was the same, but not perfectly. Again, it never repeated itself, but it was the same pace, the same energy, the same set of notes. Something about it piqued my curiosity. I needed to know what it was. Realistically, I was sure it was only someone who couldn't sleep, waking up and whistling their tune that they came up with themselves. But something about it drew me in, something sparking my curiosity. I crept to the window, careful not to make myself visible or look out myself. I waited for what felt like an eternity, but nothing changed. The tune never shifted significantly, the whistler never moved. I checked my phone repeatedly, watching the minutes go by. By the fifteen-minute mark, a growing sense of unease had settled in. I waited until exactly three in the morning, and then sprang up scanning the area outside my window. Yet only the tree sat there, surrounded by a field of yellow-brown grass, stretching into infinity. The whistling immediately ceased, and my heart pounded in my chest. I raced to my bed and sat against the corner, my covers around everything but my head. My phone flashlight pointed at the window and door to my room. At some point I must have dozed off, because the next thing I remember is my father shaking me awake at noon. He looked mildly annoyed that I had stayed up late again, but he didn't make a big deal out of it. After I had breakfast, I settled down near him on the living room couch. Something weird happened last night. An eldritch horror forced you to stay up until sunrise? I rolled my eyes in exasperation. 
I heard some guy whistling outside for like half an hour. I immediately knew something was wrong. My father's entire body tensed up, and his eyes snapped up from his newspaper to meet mine. What? I was taken aback by the sudden shift in tone, but I continued to explain. Yeah, it was weird. I heard whistling outside my window, maybe 20 feet away. I listened for a while, but as soon as I looked out the window, it stopped. He leaned towards me. When did it start? A little past 2.30? His face had gone pale. It was the most serious I'd ever seen him, and I was terrified. I had no idea what was happening, but he continued to interrogate me. Exactly when, Thomas? How long past 2.30? Two minutes, I think. Yeah, 2.32. Dad, what? Why are you acting like this? He paused, sat back, and slumped forward, head in his hands. I was frozen. I had no idea what this meant. Why did some whistling mean so much to him? He picked up his head and asked me a few more questions until I had relayed every detail of that night. He paused for a long moment, then got up and started to climb the stairs. Halfway up he turned to me. Stay inside for today. I'm going somewhere with mom. Watch Sally. The next day was Monday, and school resumed for the last time that summer. The week passed in a blur, and I said bye to all my friends who were going away to camps which was almost all of them. Finally, on Saturday, the inevitable announcement finally arrived. We gathered around the dinner table, and the mood was already uncomfortable before I'd had a bite of my spaghetti and meatballs. My mother started the conversation. So I know you guys love this town. My sister immediately interrupted. I like New York better. But your father and I had to make some financial decisions and, well, we're moving. Somehow I wasn't surprised. I had known for years it wasn't a matter of if, but when. My six-year-old sister was less than pleased when she realized our destination wasn't New York, but a suburb adjacent to Boston. I quickly finished my meal and retreated to my room. Around 10 that night I heard my parents put my sister to bed and walk down to the living room. I followed after a few minutes, and as soon as I entered the room, their quiet conversation immediately ceased. What are you guys talking about? Nothing, honey. Just... the move. Bull crap. I didn't call them out on it, though, as I sat down across from them. Dad, he looked to me. Yes? Is this because of the whistling? He didn't react immediately. Deep down, I knew. I knew that the answer was yes, but I waited for his response. Thomas, I promise you when you are older, I will explain everything, but I can't right now, so please... Just go to bed, pack, say goodbye to your friends, whatever, but know that I'm doing this for us. He paused again, locking eyes with me, for this family. Finally, I exploded. I don't remember what I said, but it wasn't pretty. After all, at the time, it seemed to me like they were tearing my life apart because of a sound I heard a couple of nights in a row. That night, I stormed upstairs in a fit of rage, eventually crying myself to sleep. I didn't hear the whistling again for a month and a half. In reality, I hadn't stayed up late enough to hear it at that time. With all the time in the world on my hands, I hadn't found a reason to stay up past midnight. After all, I had no friends in the state, much less nearby. However, my parents seemed much happier. My mother had already made some friends at some Pilates group, and my father was acting like he did in New York every day. Even my little sister had found some friends in the next door neighbors. But I spent my days in my room, dying of boredom. So in late July, I decided to try to hear the whistle again. I didn't believe I would hear it. After all, we had moved states. It would be completely illogical to think I would. And yet when 2.32 a.m. arrived, it started again. I was frozen in fear. For some reason I couldn't put my finger on it. But I listened. The tune was the same. It even sounded like the same distance and direction from my bedroom window as it had been in Indiana. After a few minutes I sprang up. This time outside my window there was a long dark alleyway. But still, as soon as I looked, nothing. The whistling came to a halt and nobody was there. I didn't tell my father about the whistling. I don't know why. I wish I had. But at that moment it felt like some little mystery for me to puzzle out. Some special secret only I had. How stupid of me. The next day, my three best friends paid us a surprise visit. As soon as camp had ended, their parents arranged a surprise trip to see me at the request of my parents. 
So for the next two days, they would be sleeping over. I was ecstatic, and it immediately took my mind off everything else. The night passed much the same as it would back in Indiana. Horror movies, video games, and an ungodly amount of snacks. At around one, I started to keep an eye on the clock as it inched forward. I felt as though I needed to show someone, just to prove I wasn't hallucinating, that the loneliness hadn't pushed me over the edge. I had made the decision to reveal the phenomenon to my friends. Once again, I wish I hadn't. I told them about 15 minutes ahead of time, and at first, they didn't believe me. After all, we had spent the past six hours binging horror movies, and past midnight was the perfect time for a scary story, or a prank if you're ambitious enough. But despite their complaining, I could tell they were intrigued, and I managed to convince them to hide under the window with me. Sure enough, the whistling began right on schedule. They didn't have the patience to listen long. Josh sprang to his feet after two minutes, despite my repeated whispered protests, and the whistling stopped. Huh, that's odd. Why did you look? I was curious. I told you not to. So? Not having enough energy to get mad over it, I surrendered frustrated and we resumed our nightly activities, eventually falling asleep at around four. The next evening my friends had a plan. David started to explain. So we just hide behind the dumpsters in the alley, then we all spring out. One of us stays in the house. If we get the whistler in between us and the window, there's no way to miss it. I pleaded with them, begging them not to, but they ignored me. I didn't even know why they were so set on catching the whistler, but they were. For some reason I knew this was a terrible idea. I felt something deep in my stomach, screaming at me to stop them. But they wouldn't give up, funding humor in my terror and ignoring me until I stopped trying to convince them. You always yell at the horror movies on TV but a group of 15-year-olds can't be convinced they've had a bad idea. No one was going to be the coward that took my side. I eventually followed them out at 2.25 that night, carefully sneaking out so as not to wake my parents. I wish I hadn't. We all ducked behind the five dumpsters lining one side of the alley. None of us looked at our phones, or even at each other outside of quick furtive glances. I could tell they were getting impatient pressed up against the freezing metal backside of a full-to-the-brim dumpster, with rats scurrying around nearby. Despite the fact that the wait couldn't have been more than five minutes, I finally risked a glance at my phone, 2.31. I snapped my eyes back to the alleyway. As my heart pounded against my ribcage, the whistling started. It was working. The whistling was coming from between us and the house. I was petrified. I knew I had to stop them from jumping out, I had to get my friend at the window to look, to get it to stop, before they exposed themselves. I don't know why I felt such a strong urge to stop them, but my gut was telling me I couldn't let them look. My phone buzzed, as did theirs. We all looked down in sync, a text from our friend in the window. Jump as soon as the clock hits 2.33. I frantically texted back, telling him to look, while shaking my head wildly. I gazed pleadingly at the two with me, begging them to stop. They simply smirked and texted back, ignore Tom. Then they jumped. I shut my eyes and held my breath, my heart skipping a beat. I curled tighter into a ball, and I waited. After a few seconds of silence, I emerged from my hiding place. My friends were standing in the middle of the alley, dumbfounded. So? I asked. What? They slowly looked at me, shaking their heads. Nothing. I took that in for a second, shocked. I thought they had to be lying but I could see on their faces that they were just as confused as I was. I paused, considering what this meant, and came to the conclusion that it meant we should get back inside ASAP, and I should never stay up past two again. All right, you had your fun, now can we pl- Before I could finish my sentence, a shrill, ear-piercing sound tore through our ears. I snapped my hands to my ears and locked eyes with my friends, seeing them do much the same. I sprinted back into the house, my friends instantly following suit. We slammed the back door shut behind us, and after a second it stopped. One long, angry note. What the hell was that, Tom? One of them shouted. I realized my legs were shaking and I slid back against the wall. I don't know, I don't know what you did, but can we please go to bed? We all stayed there in shock, until Max raced down from his position at the window. Are you guys alright? What the hell was that? 
The next day passed in a blur until after dinner. I was sitting on the living room couch on my phone, my father taking in a newspaper on the chair opposite me. He had been acting off the whole day. I knew he could tell something was wrong, but he seemed to be purposely ignoring it. So I began to tell him what happened. By the time I reached the end of my story, he was staring at me, stone-faced. But instead of shock in his eyes, there was anger. This isn't funny, Thomas. You don't understand what you're joking about. Now go to your room and do not ever say something like that again. I sprang to my feet, now angry as well. Dad, I'm not joking. Ask David or Max or Josh, they'll back me up. I swear to God, I'm not kidding. My father stood up, towering five inches over me, staring down into my eyes. It's not possible, Thomas. We left that thing in Indiana. Now go to your room. Why won't you tell me what this thing is? I retorted. If there's some goddamn monster you know about, why won't you believe me when I say I hear it? He paused for a moment, then returned softly. As when I moved to Indiana, it stayed in Washington. And when my father moved to Washington, it stayed in Montana. And you will not tell me that you have broken the chain. You will not hear the whistling again until you have a child of your own. Before I could respond, he walked briskly back to his room, shutting and locking the door behind him. I ran to catch up and hammered my fists against his door, but no response. He didn't emerge for the rest of the evening. That night, I was terrified. I tried desperately to fall asleep, but I knew I wouldn't, and sure enough, I couldn't. When the time drew near, I threw my blanket over my whole body and shoved my fingers in my ears. I'm an atheist, but that night I prayed. The whistling took a different tune for the first time. It was erratic and never repeating, but it was different in tune. Compared to its former jovial sound, it was angry, terrifying. I don't know how to describe it. It was as if all of a sudden I had interrupted its nightly routine. And it wasn't happy. It's not him or her. Whatever this is, it isn't human. It can't be. I waited for over ten minutes before it began to get louder. At first it was a negligible increase, nigh unnoticeable. Even after a couple of minutes of it slowly getting louder, I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me. But after ten more minutes, I couldn't deny it. It was getting louder, and the speed at which its volume was increasing was accelerating. It overrode every other sound I could hear, growing louder and louder, until I was sure my eardrums would burst. As it crescendoed, I couldn't take it anymore. I jolted up and craned my neck, peering out the window. As per usual, it immediately stopped. At some point that night I fell into a fitful sleep, not waking up until eleven the next morning. Once again my father ignored my pleas for help. My mother seemed worried but she inevitably took my father's side, and they forced me back to my room that night. I spent the next few hours coming up with a plan. I waited until one in the morning when I was sure they'd be asleep and snuck into my mother's bathroom, careful to avoid creaky floorboards and squeaking doors. I opened the medicine cabinet, and sure enough, there it was. Xanax. My mother was prescribed it some seven years ago, and continued to use them well after her prescription ended. I scanned the back of the container, decided on one pill, and returned the container, carefully making my way to the kitchen. I filled a glass of water and looked at the pill. I wasn't sure if this was too much. The internet had recommended half a milligram, but I couldn't continue to stay awake. I swallowed it without further thought and returned to my room. It only took about 15 minutes before the effects began to kick in. I fell asleep not long after. The whistling started right on schedule. For the first time, it jolted me awake. My heart was pounding. I felt like I should be knocked out, but I was awake. The whistling wasn't even that loud, but as I checked my phone, I realized it had awoken me right as it started. The only silver lining was that it seemed to have resumed its jovial tune, and despite the negatives of the situation, this comforted me. At first, when it began to move, my heart skipped a beat. It had shifted a bit before, but all of a sudden it quickly shot underneath my window. I froze up, terrified. It continued to move, traveling over to where my back door is. It paused for no more than a few seconds, and then I heard the click of a lock and the door swinging open. My heart pounded wildly as I heard the whistling pass under my room to the other side of the house. It traveled up my stairs without a sound other than its jubilant tune, and I began to tense my muscles and hold my breath as it approached my closed door. 
It sat at the entrance to my room for over five minutes. I knew no one else in my family could hear it now, as it was too loud for them to possibly sleep through. My face was turned to the wall, away from the door and window, but I was ready to turn. Then my door swung open, banging against my wall. I whirled around, ready to face the monster. I wasn't sure what my plan was, but I was ready to fight whatever was coming for me. But the whistling stopped instantly, and there in my doorway was my six-year-old sister. Sally, I said. I didn't realize how much I had tensed up, and as I relaxed, I realized my words were slightly slurred. The Xanax was still in effect, yet I was awake. Were you whistling? She looked confused. No, Tommy. I don't even know how to whistle. Then why the hell are you in here? It's like three in the morning. I think I left Bear in here. As I retrieved her teddy bear for her, I considered telling my parents what had happened, but the Xanax was calling me back to my bed, and the whistling had stopped for the night. I would tell them the next morning, beg them to take us to a hotel or something. As Sally left the room, I collapsed back into my bed facing the wall and began to drift back into dreamland. I only wish I had faced the other way. What happened next chilled me to my core. Right before I slipped back into sleep, the whistling started again. It was right behind me. It was angry once again, and it was looming over me, inches from my bed. I resisted the urge to scream, curling into a ball, trembling and sucking in shaky breaths. It moved closer by an inch, then another. It stopped there, probably touching my bed for what felt like an eternity. The terror I felt was incomparable to any I had felt before. No horror movie could prepare me for this. Then I felt pressure on my bed, as if it had moved onto it and I rolled over, swinging my fist. I connected solidly with my bed frame, letting out an involuntary gasp of pain. I scanned my room as I shook. Nothing. Since then I haven't moved. It's around six and the sun is rising as I write this, and I've been furtively scanning my room between every sentence. Tomorrow I'll make my parents do something, take us to a hotel maybe, but just in case, I need my story out there. Wish me luck. It seemed like since the moment I was born that the supernatural seemed drawn to me, though I wouldn't have my first real experience with it until after my second or third year of school. I must have been seven or eight at the time. I can't be sure anymore how old I was. The older you get, the more the years all seem to blend together. It was during late summer, late July most likely. Back in those days I spent a good part of the summer with my grandparents. It was okay though because that meant I got to spend time with my uncle, Leo. He was my favorite of all my dad's siblings. He was still a young man in his late twenties. He had fought in the war and lived at home to help my grandparents out. Everybody has their favorite aunt or uncle, and Leo was mine. Sometimes when he was off from his job at the meatpacking plant, he would take me swimming and fishing. We had this little spot about an hour's drive out of town that we would frequent. It was on one of those adventures that this fateful day would occur. We got to the fishing spot a little after eight in the morning, made an entire day of it. I got about 30 fish that day, a record for me at the time, but that's not why I remember that day. That's not why I remember it at all. The day had been perfect up to that point, but as all days must they eventually have to end. It was starting to get late, the sun was already starting to set when we decided to call an end to our fishing expedition. We were packing up the truck when I first noticed it. Silence. I don't mean it was quiet. No, I mean there was no sound, no nothing, no birds, no insects. Heck, even the wind had stopped blowing. It was eerie. The sun fading in the back and the void of sound around us. Suddenly there was this growl, almost a roar actually. I couldn't pinpoint where it was coming from. The way it echoed through the air, it could have been coming from any direction. But one thing was clear. It sounded to be getting closer to us as the seconds ticked away. It sounded like it was maybe half a football field away. That was when I heard the rustling from the trees just to the left, almost directly above us. Something was up there, something large. You could hear the leaves rustling, branches snapping as whatever it was jumped from tree to tree. I looked over at my uncle. If he heard it, then I'll never know. He was paying it no mind, just packing up all of our stuff never once looking up or picking up the pace. To this day, I still believe he knew it was there at that time, but he was paying it no heed as not to panic me. 
fear of whatever this was, started to overtake me. I stopped what I had been doing almost completely. Helping load up our gear was the farthest thing from my mind. I started to become frozen with fear. My uncle had to practically yell at me to snap my attention back to him. We're almost packed up, Reko. Let's get going. It's late already and your grandmother is going to be worried if we aren't home soon. Hurriedly, I helped him pack up the remainder of our gear into the truck. Whatever had made that sound, I wanted no part of meeting it or finding out what it was. We got the truck packed and I took one last look around to see if I saw anything before hopping in the passenger side of my uncle's truck. It was still dusk, not yet completely dark. As we drove down the road, the light was quickly fading overhead. My uncle flipped on the radio. I don't even remember what was playing at the time, probably some jazz song. My uncle loved that type of music. We had been on the road about 10 minutes when things began to feel not all right. You know that feeling you get deep inside your gut when you know something was wrong? I was feeling something fierce. Suddenly the headlights began to dim and the radio began to fade in and out, and from above us that rustling sound had returned. Uncle Leo played with the dial some, but once again he ignored the noise, his focus remained on the quickly darkening road. It was then that it happened, I'll never forget it, the horror, the fear, the uncertainty. We had just taken a curve on the road, the rustling sound had gotten louder, closer, when unexpectedly, bam. Something big and heavy landed in the back of the truck. It had leaped down from the trees above. It landed with such force that the front wheels of the truck temporarily lifted off the road. My uncle almost lost control of the truck as it skidded across the road. Leo looked briefly in the mirror then moved his eyes back to the road. He briefly touched the crucifix he kept on the dash, then tightly gripped the wheel with both hands. His knuckles turned white with how hard he gripped it. I just sat there staring ahead frozen in fear. Whatever it was, it was moving around in the bed of the truck. I could hear it going through our stuff, tossing things around, rummaging through our cooler. I started to get up in my seat so I could look back and see what was back there. Uncle Leo grabbed me by the shoulder and pushed me back down into my seat. No, mijo, just look ahead, don't look in the back. Whatever you do, trust me. There was fear in his voice. Not a lot, but a hint of it. This was a man that had lived through the horrors of war, and he was scared. I can tell you I did exactly as he said without question. I could hear a small growl from the back, and whatever was back there was moving around the tailgate. Whatever it was, it was heavy. The truck leaned towards the back because of the weight. For the next five minutes, I sat there frozen in fear. I looked at Leo. He just stared ahead, occasionally glancing at his rearview mirror. Unsure of what to do. I sat there. Fear had completely overtaken me. I didn't know if the thin layer of glass between us and the bed was enough to keep us separated. As my mind ran through every possibility of what was back there that my biggest fear came to be. Whatever was in the bed of the truck was moving. Not like before when it had stayed in the rear of the bed. No, this time it was moving forward towards the cab of the truck. I was petrified. I couldn't move. The creature had begun a slow, methodical move towards us. The nails of the beast scrapped against the metal of the truck. The truck shifted with its weight as it moved slowly closer to us. Don't look, I will explain later, trust me. I trusted my uncle, but I was scared. We were still miles out of town. All that separated us from whatever was in the back was a sheet of glass. No one lived near where we were for miles, meaning no help if somehow that thing decided to come into the bed. The creature kept getting closer, the scrapping louder. I could hear its heavy breathing now. My uncle kept looking ahead at the road. I saw in their left hand though he had slowly unclipped the strap holding his sidearm he kept on his belt. Then there was the tapping. You could hear the nails of the creature gently tapping the glass directly behind my head. Tap. 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 The tears of fear begin to well up in my eyes. Tap. 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 The creature was just begging us to turn around. What were we going to do? What was it? Why did my uncle seem to know what it was? What if it gets inside? I was beyond scared. Nothing in my short life came close to the fear I felt at that moment. Just look ahead, no matter what. Never look back. I'll never forget those words my uncle spoke or the sound of fear in his voice. But that wasn't the worst of it. No, not even close. What happened next I still dream about at night sometimes.
An eerie, raspy voice spoke from behind me. A gasp escaped my lips and tears began to flow freely down my cheeks. My Uncle Leo gave the voice no notice and fiddled with the radio more. Do not ignore me. Let me in. Face your fate. Angrier and louder, the voice boomed. Then the banging started. The creature, or whatever it was, began banging on the roof of the cab with such force that the truck began to rock with each blow. Bang. Boom. Bang. The blows rained down on my poor uncle's truck. But still, I refused to look back. This continued for the next 30 minutes or so. Just when I thought the roof would cave in from the blows being rained down upon us, I saw the lights of the city as we neared the edge of the forest. A roar erupted from behind us, and the creature muttered these final words. This is not the end, no little one. One day we meet our fates. That protection won't be there for you forever. Till then. And with that, the truck rocked as whatever was in the bed leaped in the air and away from the truck. We sped forward in complete silence. My uncle said nothing. When we were about two blocks from my grandparents, my uncle pulled over and finally turned to me. Rico, we must talk. You can never tell your grandparents what happened here. There is much you do not know and not enough time for me to tell you everything. The world is filled with great evils. Our family, some of our family are chosen. We have a gift to see the other world. Not all of us are as strong. Some just see glimpses. Others like me and you, well, we can interact with that world. But there are creatures that live within that world that don't appreciate our gift. They prefer to remain hidden from view as they do their work, but there are rules they must follow and ways we can protect ourselves. I'm going to give you something. My grandfather gave it to me when I was about your age. Now it's yours. With that, my uncle grabbed the crucifix around his mirror and put it around my neck. I had never noticed before the uniqueness of it. There was a large black rock in the middle, obsidian and the outside of it was glass, with a thick red liquid inside. I have never taken it off since my uncle gave it to me. It's still around my neck to this very day. My uncle made me promise to never tell outsiders about what happened. They wouldn't believe it anyways, he said. After that night he said we could never talk about it again. Talking about it gives them strength. We talked for about an hour more on that side of the road. He told me about where they come from, and of the evil and corruption that they wished to spread. Afterward, we continued our drive home. True to his word, my uncle never again spoke of that evening with me, and I, well, I wasn't going to bring it up. About ten years later, just outside of those woods, Uncle Leo crashed his truck and was killed. I've often wondered if whatever had jumped on our truck, that long ago night, had somehow caught up to him finally. The world is a beautiful place, no one can argue that, but there are evils out there. Some that stay hidden just beneath the light. Never forget that. Some things can't be explained, and perhaps it's for the best that they aren't. All it took was a heavy rainstorm to break my spirit. When the thunder rumbled and the raindrops started their relentless drumming, I felt that old terror seize me, the one that echoed the screams of the past. The guilt inside me reacted like a beast to the lightning growing restless and gnawing at my consciousness. It's been this way since the accident. Eight lives taken because I couldn't see the damn road. I became an expert at drowning out storms. When the storm approached, I pulled the curtains tight, sealed the windows, and buried my ears under my old noise-canceling headphones, their worn-out pads a familiar comfort. But tonight, as the storm raged outside, the power in my house cut out. I was plunged into a suffocating silence, broken only by the terrifying symphony of thunder and rain. For some reason it wasn't the darkness that frightened me but the whispers. They called my name, floating towards me on the gusts of wind that threatened to shake the house apart. I brushed it off as my mind playing tricks, a desperate ploy to keep itself busy in the face of the terror outside, until I heard the knocking. A soft, rhythmic knocking that echoed the frantic beats of my heart. I held my breath, listening, hoping I'd imagined it. The knock came again, more insistent. I found myself drawn towards the sound like a moth to a flame. Against every instinct in me to cower and hide, I grabbed the old baseball bat from the closet, its worn wood reassuringly solid under my clammy palms. My mind was a whirlwind of fear and confusion, 
Who could be out there in the middle of this maelstrom? I flung open the door, steeling myself for a confrontation, but found nothing but the storm. Rain and wind lashed at my face, drenching me in an instant. The whispers grew louder, a taunting chorus carried on the gale. I stepped outside, hoping to catch sight of whoever was playing this cruel prank. The door slammed shut behind me, carried by the force of the wind. The click of the lock resonated in the storm, echoing my growing sense of dread. Through the curtain of rain, I saw her, a woman, sitting on my porch, her dress whipping around her in the wind. She was holding something, my spare key. I squinted, trying to make out her face, but what I saw sent my heart plummeting. The face was pale, almost luminescent in the storm's gloom, split by a jagged sewn-up gash from forehead to chin. It was her, one of the victims of the accident. A bolt of raw fear shot through me, my heart pounding so hard I was sure it would burst from my chest. But the woman, ghost, whatever she was, didn't move. She just sat there, clutching my key, watching me. A cold shiver ran down my spine as she lifted a finger to her lips. Was she telling me to be quiet? Or was she asking me to listen? The storm roared around me, and for the first time since the accident, I stopped trying to block it out. I stood there drenched and terrified, listening to the whispers on the wind. Their message was clear. This was just the beginning. No amount of wishful thinking could wipe the slate clean. You can bury your past, bury your guilt, but it seeps into the soil and taints the groundwater. It was a truth I knew all too well. That day started off just like any other. As the county sheriff, I had a duty to protect and serve. I woke early, had a strong cup of coffee, and started the long drive to the station. It was a route I knew like the back of my hand, my car snaking its way through the twisting, turning mountain roads. The storm was unprecedented. It descended on us without warning, a roaring tempest that swallowed up the day. I drove through the downpour, windshield wipers struggling to keep up, every droplet on the glass a bullet of distraction, but I kept driving. I was the sheriff. People were counting on me. Then a flash of light, a patch of wet asphalt. I lost control. The car skidded, spinning out on the wet road. Then the terrifying crunch of metal, the shattering of glass. In that split second, I saw them, a minivan full of kids, their faces pale in the lightning, and then darkness. When I came to, the storm had passed leaving in its wake a silence that was louder than any thunder. The air reeked of gasoline and burnt rubber. The minivan was a wreck, crumpled against a tree. Inside were eight young lives, extinguished, snuffed out like candles in the storm. I lived, they didn't. It was a burden I had to carry, an anchor that dragged me down every waking moment. My career, my reputation all lay in shambles. I retreated from the world, my home in the outskirts of the town becoming my fortress of solitude. The guilt was my constant companion, as loyal as a shadow. And now, years later, the past had found its way to my door, bringing with it a chilling reckoning. The woman, the victim, the ghost. She was a reminder of my deepest guilt, my greatest fear. The stitched up face, the silent accusation in her eyes, they were etched into my memory. That night, as I lay wide awake, the storm raging outside, my guilt took on a new form. The past was not something I could outrun. The whispers in the storm, the spectral woman on my porch, they were all parts of a puzzle, a grim riddle that I had to solve. I could no longer ignore the guilt, the fear, the whispers. I couldn't hide behind my old noise-canceling headphones, couldn't retreat into my fortress. This was a storm I had to face, a ghost I had to confront. As dawn broke, piercing the gloom with weak rays of sunshine, I made a decision. I would go back to the crash site, back to where it all began. The journey would not be easy, the wounds it would reopen would be raw and painful. But I had to do it. I had to confront my past. For the eight lives lost, for the ghost on my porch, and for me. The whispers on the wind were a call to action, a message from the storm. I had to listen. I had to face my past because this was just the beginning. See, the thing about the past is, I muttered to myself, driving through the desolate mountain pass, you can't erase it, you can only confront it. The storm that had been raging in my head had now manifested itself in the sky, echoing my torment, my guilt, my fear. 
It felt as though the universe was in sync with my inner turmoil. The roads were familiar yet foreign. Years had passed since I'd last traveled these routes, and time had left its indelible marks, just as it had on me. The thunderous roars and the rain pelting against the windshield served as a constant reminder of that fateful night. The once bustling town was now nothing more than a ghost town. Nature had reclaimed the town, the dilapidated houses standing like silent witnesses to a bygone era. The faint echo of children's laughter, the residual warmth of a community, all were now replaced by the cold gusts of wind and the eerie silence. My destination was the site of my worst nightmare, the scar that had never healed, the crash site. I parked the car at a safe distance, my heart pounding in my chest. The rain had reduced to a drizzle, nature pausing to witness my confrontation with my past. The site was haunting, the crumpled tree, the shattered glass still scattered on the ground, the faint traces of tire marks, all silent witnesses of that horrifying night. My knees buckled as the weight of my guilt bore down on me. I fell to the ground, my eyes welling up with tears. A flicker of movement caught my eye. I looked up, my heart in my mouth. There she was, the spectral woman, standing a few feet away, her eyes empty, her face a mirror to my guilt. The silence between us was deafening. I stood up, my legs shaking, my eyes not leaving her. I walked towards her, each step a battle against my fear. But I had to do it. I owed it to her. I owed it to them. As I reached her, I looked into her eyes, my guilt reflected in them. My voice choked, my words a mere whisper carried away by the wind. I'm sorry, I said, my voice barely audible. She didn't say anything, just kept staring at me. And then, as if on cue, a gust of wind blew, and she vanished leaving behind only the chilling emptiness. The whispers on the wind seemed to subside, replaced by a haunting silence. I was left standing alone, my guilt still gnawing at my soul. The rain had stopped, replaced by a gloomy silence. I had confronted my past, apologized for my guilt. But was it enough? The only answer was the cold wind whispering in my ear. And in that moment, I realized that this journey was far from over. This was just the beginning. The whispers in the wind the ghostly woman. They were all a part of a mystery I had to unravel, and I was ready to face it all, ready to chase the whispers. The musty smell of damp earth and age-old secrets hung heavily in the cryptic woodland. Trees stood like ancient sentinels, their leaves whispering secrets that were as old as time itself. The air was thick with an eerie stillness that weighed on my shoulders, amplifying my apprehension. A mournful howl echoed through the night, sending a chill down my spine. The spectral woman's presence seemed to permeate the forest, wrapping around the trees and sinking into the soil. The ghostly cold of her touch seemed to reach me, even though she wasn't there physically. I started the trek towards the cabin. Each crunching step on the leaf-littered ground seemed to echo my pounding heart. The cabin, once a beacon of warmth and family, now stood ominously in the heart of the woods, darkened windows seeming like gaping blind eyes. The memories of laughter and camaraderie now seemed like whispers on the wind. I unlocked the door with a shaky hand. The old wood creaked open, revealing a dusty room, the air heavy with years of solitude. The moonlight filtered through the broken window, casting long, haunting shadows. My boots echoed in the silent room as I stepped inside, the echoes serving as a chilling reminder of the life this cabin once held. A chill ran down my spine as a sudden gust of wind blew the door shut. The silence was disrupted by the soft rustle of papers. I turned around to see an old photo album lying open on the dusty table. The faces of my family smiled back at me, oblivious of the tragedy that was to befall them. My fingers traced their faces, my heart heavy with guilt and sorrow. A soft whisper echoed in the room, making me jolt up. I looked around, my eyes scanning the room, but saw no one. The room felt colder, the air denser. The whispers grew louder, a cacophony in the silence, echoing my guilt, my fear. The spectral woman appeared in the moonlit room, her presence casting a cold pallor. Her empty eyes bore into mine, reflecting my guilt. You could have saved them, she whispered, her voice the embodiment of my deepest fears. I fell to my knees, the guilt overwhelming me. The room began to spin, the whispers growing louder, echoing the horrifying truth. I could have saved them. Suddenly everything went silent, the spectral woman disappeared, leaving behind the chilling emptiness. The moonlight had dimmed, 
casting long, foreboding shadows. The silence was broken by a distant wail, a sorrowful cry of a creature in pain. The whispering wind carried a horrifying realization. The spectral woman was not just an embodiment of my guilt, but a manifestation of my fear, my regret. This was my hell, my eternal torment. I was alone in the cabin, my guilt my only company. Outside the woods echoed with sorrowful cries, a grim symphony that would haunt me forever. The spectral woman, the whispers, the guilt, they were all a part of me, etched into my soul. I was trapped in this endless cycle of guilt and fear, bound to relive my worst nightmare. The whispers in the wind were a constant reminder of my sin, my failure, and as I sank into the darkness, the last whisper I heard was a chilling promise, a promise of eternal torment. A few years back, my girlfriend and I, having hiked several other parts of the Appalachian Trail, decided we wanted to give the southern portion of Virginia's trail a shot. It's about 166 miles long and runs through George Washington and Jefferson National Forests. This is definitely one of those more remote and less traveled parts of the trail, which is exactly what we were looking for. We gathered our gear and made our way up to the start of the Virginia Creeper Trail to begin our journey. We had planned our journey to end at Damascus and figured by the time that we got there we would be more than ready to get home to our own beds. It was early October and the changing of the leaves and the colors were amazing. The air was crisp and cool, perfect hiking weather with beautiful scenery. The majority of the trip was pretty uneventful, just your typical hike, but our last couple of nights is where things got weird. On this portion of the hike, you were supposed to camp on the trail or a designated shelter. We didn't really want to run into other people and didn't want anyone cupping up on us in the middle of the night. We decided to ignore the suggestions and find our own little spot off the trail. A bit of searching and we found a little spot off the trail in the middle of a small clearing. It was perfect. We set up camp, cooked some food, talked for a while then snuggled up and went to sleep for the night. Somewhere around 2am I was awoken by my girlfriend, shaking me, telling me, someone is outside walking around our tent. She informed me that she woke up with what sounded like someone right outside the tent, running a stick or something along the side while circling us. When hiking, I carry a 1911 and a judge with me. You never know exactly who or what you might run into when on such a long hike in a remote location. I got the judge out of my bag and then sat silently listening for any sounds. A few minutes of nothing but the breeze blowing through the trees and then I heard it. Someone or something was walking in the woods behind our tent. I got the flashlight and silently made my way out of the tent. Our fire had went out so it was nearly pitch black, illuminated by only the dim glow of the October moon. I told my girlfriend to stay put while I checked it out. I didn't flick the flashlight on right away as to not give away that I was out of the tent and had to become a shining beacon of my location. Instead, I waited to hear more noises. It sounded like it was something on two legs by the way its steps were placed. I turned on the flashlight and flooded the area with light. I saw someone move behind a tree. I yelled out and told them to go away and that I was armed. I kept the light on the area with my arms drawn and slowly approached towards the area where I thought I saw the figure. Then from my right I hear a sound of someone running through the woods. I spin and face my light that way, and then from the original spot hear who or whatever was there take off into the woods. There's no way I'm giving chase, so I return to the campsite. I tell my girlfriend about what happened, and I end up sitting guard outside the tent in the darkness until daybreak. In the morning, I look around for a bit for signs of who or whatever it was, and I discovered a boot print in some of the soft moist dirt not too far from our tent. It wasn't mine and it wasn't my girl's. This freaked me out as it confirmed that someone, perhaps more than one, was soaking around our tent in the dark. I kept it to myself because I didn't want to freak my girl out any more than she already was. At this point, we were already pretty deep in and still had two days left. That day, we walked a little faster than normal and covered as much ground as possible. When it came time to set up camp, I found a spot near a cliff where we could place the tent in a small overhang and prevent anyone from coming up behind us. The whole day up to this point, I had a feeling that we were being followed. I had no confirmation of this as I hadn't seen or heard anyone else, but it was just a gut feeling. We set up camp and made some food then retreated to the tent. I gave my girl the 1911 and I kept the judge right next to me, and I assured her that if I slept at all, 
it would be with one eye open. After a while, she drifted off to sleep and I stayed awake listening to the sounds of the woods at night. I was awake for a few hours just waiting to see if anything was going to happen. At some point, I guess my exhaustion caught up with me and I drifted off. I awoke some time later to what sounded like someone going through our stuff outside our tent. I grabbed my gun and woke my girlfriend, shushing her to be quiet. From the faint glow of the fire, I could see someone's silhouette against the tent. There was really someone out there. I yelled out something along the lines of, we are armed, get out of here. They dropped what they were doing and bolted. I came out of the tent ready to go crazy on someone. Our stuff was scattered everywhere. I walked to the edge of the woods in the direction whoever was out there had fled. There was a creek nearby and I walked to the edge where there was a small trail running alongside it. Down the creek I could see a light. It looked like a lantern the way it flickered. Then I saw three more emerge from the other side of the woods. I told my girlfriend to start packing up whatever she could and that we were leaving now. We packed up everything of value, left the tent and a few other items and headed back on the trail in the middle of the night. I kept hearing people talking off in the woods and hearing branches snap for quite some time. I kept looking behind us every few seconds to make sure nobody was coming up on us. It was completely nerve-wracking. If something happened, we were still a long ways from anywhere and quite literally on our own. Since we hadn't seen any other hiker the entire time we had been out there, I really felt that we were in serious danger. We had been walking for quite some time when I heard something in the woods behind us. As we rounded a corner, I turned around and saw someone step onto the trail and just stand there watching us. It was just as the sun was coming up and barely any light. I couldn't make out any features, just a silhouette. I stopped and looked at them for a second and asked them who they were and what they wanted. They just stood there silently, watching us, and then turned and walked back into the woods. We picked up the pace and kept going, looking back every so often. We didn't see them again, but my gut told me they were still following us for a while. We eventually reached the end of the trail and got to where we had parked my girlfriend's car, extremely exhausted. We made it out of the Virginia woods without becoming a meal for a clan of hillbillies, which is what I pictured happening in my head the whole time. I had no idea who they were or what they wanted. Maybe it was someone just messing with us. Maybe it really was a clan of hillbillies. I will never know because I will not be returning to find out. At the time, I was 10 years old and lived in a small coastal town in Newfoundland. Almost every house had acres of forestry behind it, which in itself was very beautiful. As I now am 21 and live in a bustling city in Alberta, I do find myself missing this setting in my old backyard every once in a while, but it's usually accompanied by the unsettling memory of what I'm about to recount. By the time I was in grade 4, I was already trusted to be home by myself as my mother went to visit my grandmother at Gaunt who literally lived a few minutes down the road from us. I was happy to have such a privilege. I was an only child and my father worked in another province months at a time, so I was very lucky to have this opportunity. It usually meant late night movies and video gaming, and on the odd night, exploring the forest. This night, I was exploring said woods. I never went too far, usually up to a large rock formation I like to climb and look through the trees in all directions. The house was always in sight, so I never felt scared or frightened being out there. It felt like my own private place that I could enjoy. So as I was scaling the rocks to sit in my usual spot, I suddenly started hearing a sound further in. A sound that wasn't natural at all. Crying. Faint crying. It sounded like a child, maybe even an infant, crying relentlessly. I was more puzzled than scared since crying was the last thing I would expect to hear in the forest. I must have listened for a good few minutes, convinced my ears were playing tricks on me, but it was in fact crying. In my mind, I imagined that there was a young girl that somehow wandered off too far into the forest and needed help. I considered going back to the house and calling my mother to help out, but then I worried that the girl would wander further and I wouldn't be able to hear her anymore. I decided to try to locate the sound myself. I made my way hastily through the trees and branches, trying to figure out the exact direction the crying was in. It definitely wasn't easy as I thought, and it was a matter of trial and error to make sure that I was going in the right direction. One thing I never realized as I was doing all this was how consistent the crying was. No pauses, no words of any kind, just non-stop sobbing and wailing that had no end. What I did notice was that the closer I got to the sound, the more metallic it sounded to me. I had eventually reached a small clearing that had only a few small trees and bushes and nothing else. I had never gone this far before, and this was the first time I had ever seen it. 
When I made my way in, it didn't take long for me to find the source of the sound. A gray tape recorder was peeking out of one of the bushes, and the crying was coming out of the speakers. This really disturbed me, as I had went all this way expecting to find a real person, but it was only a tape recorder. As I was about to shut it off, I heard another sound coming from just outside the clearing on the opposite side. It sounded like steady footsteps advancing in my direction. It only took seeing a tall shadowy figure coming my way to send me running. Fortunately, by some miracle, I recognized my way back by identifying rocks and trees I had identified as landmarks. Looking back, this probably saved my life. I never looked back and I didn't try to listen to see if the person was following me. I just kept telling myself to make it home and nothing else. I had to get home. Once I saw the large rock formation, it didn't take me long to know the rest of the way without needing to survey my surroundings. I was out of the forest in record time and immediately ran into my house, locking the door and shutting all the lights off as I went to my bedroom. I didn't want this person to know where I lived, or I really would be done for. After shutting the curtains of my window, I peeked through them as discreetly as I could to see if whoever had been out there had actually managed to keep up with me. I didn't see anyone, but stayed at the window for a good hour, waiting for something to emerge out of the forest shadows, but nothing ever did. After that, I went straight to bed. I never did tell my mother about what happened that night, and I also never was able to go back into that forest again. Despite a few creepy instances as a child, there has only been one time in my adult life that I truly felt primal fear. My apology if it's a little long, but trust I'm being as concise as possible and need to explain the surroundings a little at first. I live in a village in the middle of the English countryside. To paint an accurate picture of its size, it has a population of 4,000, but it feels more like a thousand due to its spread out nature and being surrounded on all sides by lots of fields. Farms and woods eventually connect to one pretty famous forest. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere and because of this, it has notoriously bad phone and internet connections. Having lived here all my life, I know this place like the back of my hand. I know where all the public footpaths through the woods are, where they connect, which are shortcuts, where to cross deep streams, etc. I have gone on walks in this area throughout my childhood with my parents and alone as an adult. I felt safe here. This story takes place last summer in July after I moved home from university. As usual, this day both my parents got home at 5 p.m. We had dinner for a while longer than usual as my mom had quite a hectic day and was telling me about it. Because of this, I ended up heading out for my walk an hour later than routine, around 7 p.m. But as it was summer, the sun was still shining, so honestly I didn't really notice that it would start getting dark until I was out. The woodland closest to my house is less than 5 minutes away and you enter through a gate into a farmer's field. You can see across the open area quite far until the first set of small woods obscures your view. That's where I was heading as I knew this track takes under two hours and leads back to the same path I was standing on now. This entire area is very popular for dog walkers, so it's not unusual to see other people while you are out and about. And as this village, everybody says hello to everybody. I start walking. I'm just in my own world for a while until less than 100 feet before the entrance of the woods. An elderly man was coming out of them throwing a ball for his collie dog. As I got closer, I recognized it was John who lived on the road next to mine and knew my grandpa. We stopped and I said hello as I patted his dog Max. While talking, I see another man coming out of the woods. No dog. Bright green jacket, very tall, and a good 10 years on me age-wise. John and I chatter another minute and say goodbye. He warns me not to stay out there too long as it will be getting dark soon. True, the sky was bright pink and orange. The sun was indeed beginning to set. I hadn't really noticed. I continued down the path towards the man. When we are nearly passing each other, I look up to make brief eye contact, smile and say hello, like everyone here does, even if you don't recognize the person. My eyes instantly met his. He was already looking at me. His dark eyes locked on mine. He wasn't smiling. I didn't know him at all, but I knew something was wrong. It was in his eyes. I swallowed my politeness and looked to the ground as we passed. I had lived in my uni city the past couple years so I knew a red flag when I saw one and my country bumpkin manners evaporated. I quickened my pace a little before entering the woods and shyly looked back. The guy was still walking in the same direction following John. I felt relieved starting to walk into the woods. It takes about 30 minutes to follow the path through the woods to the end. 
The pathway exit opened into another field that led to another set of woods. The sky was now a dark purple, the dimming light it having been obscured to me by the trees. I was near the entrance of the second set of woods when I felt it. Fear. Complete crippling and absolute fear worked its way like electricity through me. I never felt anything like it before or since, but I knew what it was. I whipped around. Standing at the exit of the first set of woods was the man. I could still make out his green jacket in the fading light. He's doubled back, and very quickly too. I had looked back several times while in those trees, and he hadn't been there. For a second I froze, as he did. He knew I'd seen him. To sprint the distance between us it would take him about five minutes. He was obviously in good shape. I bolted into the woods. There was only one way I could go. I didn't care to look behind me. I sprinted for a couple of minutes before taking a sharp left turn off the path into the trees, hoping to throw him off a bit, but I couldn't see a thing. The light was already darkening and the trees made it a hundred times worse, especially as I was now in the thick of them. Their branches catching my clothes like fingers, whipping and scratching my bare legs so badly. I ran and ran and my lungs protested in pain, while my heart was beating like mad. I couldn't anymore. I got myself on the ground behind a big tree, my back against it, knees to my chest, hand over my mouth to stifle my breathing, desperately trying to pump air into my lungs for the next sprint. I listened for the first time. A few seconds passed silently. Then I hear him. Heavy footsteps snapping twigs behind me about twenty feet to my left. I dare not to look in case he sees me. I have my phone but I know I have little chance of signal being where I was, and he'd either hear me talking or see the light from the display. I'm not ashamed to say at this point I started to cry, the tears falling silently down my cheeks. What the hell? I hear a deep voice exclaim. Where are you? I know you're here. I saw you. I have to clasp both my hands across my mouth to stop myself from making a noise. I can hear him moving around. I panic and find that I have the courage to slowly peek from behind the tree. He was about ten feet behind me, less than twenty feet to my left, with his back to me. I moved back and my eyes search the surrounding area. I pick up a pretty heavy rock. I carefully check him again. His back still turned but he's searching through the trees. Hunched down lower to the ground now. I make a snap decision and with everything I had left in me I threw the rock behind me to the right. It clattered through the branches of the trees and made one hell of a noise. I watched him immediately bolt in its direction, laughing. He laughed. I paused a little hearing his footsteps get quieter until I thought I wouldn't be so visible to him if I moved and threw myself forward. I ran, trying to put as much distance between us as possible, but I was also aware that I was getting farther and farther away from home. I knew there had to be a stream somewhere close. If I found the stream I can follow it as it borders the land and runs parallel to some of the footpaths. I ran until the trees finally cleared and I can just make out another field through them on the other side. I thank god and I push myself a little bit further till I'm out of the trees. The ground disappears from below my feet and I go head over shoulders down the stream embankment. I crash into the water below. As I sputter it out I feel both relieved to have found the stream and terrified that he's heard me. My phone is now ruined. I slowly make my way downstream as quiet as possible, listening for him the whole time as the stream borders the woods, looking up periodically just in case. After a while, maybe a half hour, I notice the trees begin to thin out and realize this is the edge of the woods where I would have been exiting and where my pathway connected to the original one I'd started on. If I ran, I could get home in less than twenty minutes. As quiet as I could, I drag myself on my stomach back up the embankment, army style wanting to stay as low as possible. I peek over the top. I could just barely make out the opening of the woods exit path about fifty feet away. I sat and scanned the forest line for a couple of minutes, my eyes trying to make out movement despite it now being pitch black. Nothing. I couldn't hear anything either. I pushed myself up and sprinted as fast as I could across the field onto the pathway. I knew the gate that I'd entered through was in the adjoining field. It really wasn't far. I was so happy. I hear a screech from across the field. I swore my legs nearly gave out then and there. He had been waiting for me. I turned my head and saw him sprinting out of the woods at full pelt. I yelled and pushed myself further, tears coating my face. All I could do was run. I crossed into the main field now and I could see the moonlight shining off the metal gate. My house was just five minutes away after that. I have never focused on anything as much as that gate. He was faster than me and getting closer, yelling at me the whole time. 
I ran, pushing myself up and over the gate and ran up the road. I dared look as I made the turn from my road. He was still following me. I raced up my driveway and threw myself in the door, running into the living room crying, yelling hysterically. My dad ran outside while my mom grabbed a hold of me as I collapsed, shaking. As it turns out, my parents had already called the police. As I said, I was going out for an hour or so at 7, and it was now past 12, and I hadn't answered when they had called my now broken phone. We called the police again to explain. They came and I gave a full statement. Both my parents and the police were surprised. Nothing like this happens here. There hasn't been a major reported crime in at least a hundred years. But one look at me and it was obvious I was telling the truth. I was covered head to toe in marks, soaking wet and covered in mud. I won't go into how this experience changed me, it's depressing. But I will say the thing that scares me the most is that they never even had a suspect. Despite him following me so closely, he was gone by the time my dad ran outside. That guy is still out there, and who knows what he's really capable of. On a weekend in the fall, a friend asked me if I wanted to go camping. I'm definitely not an outdoors person, nor do I enjoy being in the forest. I agreed though because I felt bad since this friend had asked me before and I declined. As soon as I agreed, I immediately regretted it. I honestly don't even know where we were, but my friend drove for hours away from the town we were living in at the time. The forest was so thick it was literally what you see in scary movies. My friend told me I was being a wimp, but I got a weird vibe from the whole situation. We had arrived in the evening, so by the time we put up our tent, it was dark. What is that? I asked when I pointed to the number written on the tent. 4054. I don't know, something that was there when we bought it, my friend said. I didn't think much of it, but I was still creeped out by the fact that we were literally in the middle of nowhere. I woke up, but I'm guessing it was around 3 in the morning and I heard what sounded like someone making strange noises, almost animalistic. My friend sat up and looked at me. I was about to ask if he heard it too, when we heard branches snapping right behind the entrance of our tent. I could see someone's shadow right through it. They were crouched down, sitting right next to us. I guess I was thinking of calling the cops because I grabbed my phone, but there was no cell service. The person left and my friend and I were too scared to try to leave. Then we heard something else. The tent was being unzipped, but slowly. One zip at a time like it was in slow motion. Get out of here, my friend yelled, throwing something at the entrance. It actually worked and the person ran off. Again, the animalistic noises occurred at this point. Let's make a run for the car. I glanced out of the tent to see the car way in the distance. Windows smashed and tires popped. We're stuck, literally trapped. My friend was freaking out. We'll walk in the morning to try to get cell service. Then we'll call one of my other friends to come get us, I remember saying. The wait for morning seemed excruciating. We didn't sleep at all that night and I kept hearing branches snap. Finally, at the first light, we quickly peeked out of the tent and decided to walk to get cell service. When we got outside the tent, I was scared. Where the tent said 5054. Someone had crossed it out with red marker, then wrote underneath it, Tent 4054 is no more, with tons of exclamation points. My friend and I kept walking closer to get out of the forest and finally got cell service. When we finally had our friend come pick us up, we were telling him the entire story. See what they did to the car? As I pointed to the damage and ruined vehicle, I saw someone dramatically sit up. They had reclined the passenger seat, and when I looked, they were sitting perfectly upright as the seat rose up. They turned and looked out the window straight at us. A huge, animated smile was on the man's face. All of us were freaked out and our friend drove away quickly. I still think of tent. 454 is no more. I don't want to know what that was supposed to mean. In March of 2003, when I was 17, my brother and I took a weekend camping trip to the Los Padres National Forest. We had gone there many times with our family for day camping, swimming, and just lounging around. This time though, we went alone for a two night camping trip at our favorite spot that most locals simply called the Gorge. We will never forget this weekend for all the wrong reasons. We got there Saturday morning around 9am and hiked the five miles out to the Gorge. The gorge is a large swimming hole with a huge 60-foot rock cliff boulder that visitors love to jump from into the deep water below. 
The jumping rock cliff is very steep, and one must jump in a specific location below to ensure they do not hit the rocks protruding from the wall face. The area has many primitive camping spots and is overall a beautiful yet isolated place. The first day was very fun and after a long day of swimming, catching crawdads, jumping from rocks and just relaxing, we set up our tent, made a fire, ate our cans of spaghettios and a few crawdads we had cooked for dinner. Towards the end of dinner, we were visited by a large group of students who were camping further down the river. They stated they were students from the Bay Area who had a few nights left in their almost two week long school camping trip. We offered them some chips and snacks and chatted a bit with them before they made their hike back to their camping spot. It soon got dark and my brother and I got ready for bed. My brother was two years younger than I and had a deep fear of isolation. So we slept in the same tent and agreed that we would keep the fire burning the entire night to ease his anxiety. We put five large logs onto the fire and crept inside our tent and got into our sleeping bags. We both fell asleep very fast as we were exhausted from the day. Around 2.30 in the morning we were both awoken by a large splash of water near our tent that put out our fire. We heard no voices and could not see much from inside our tent. We froze in terror. My brother began to cry and I tried to calm him down. I told him that I would go outside to investigate and that everything would be okay. I told him that our water bladder must have fallen off the tree where we had hung it and I'm sure it was some kind of coincidence. I grabbed my flashlight, unzipped our tent and stepped outside. I pointed the flashlight over the fire pit and saw four large men sitting around our fireplace staring at me with what I can only describe as expressionless faces. It appears as though they had split open our two gallon water bladder that we had hung over the tree and had thrown it into the fire. I was in shock and I didn't know what to say. For about five seconds none of them said anything, we just stared at each other. Then one of them said in a deep voice, Get your friend out here. Then I heard my brother hyperventilating and screaming in our tent in a way that made me feel helpless. I had no weapons and my brother and I were outnumbered two to one. I asked the men what they wanted and told them that we could just leave and that we are sorry if we had taken their camping spot or invaded their area. They ignored my question and just stood up. That is when I saw two of the four men were holding something in their hands. Long swords shaped in appearance like a machete or a small sword, but they looked homemade and very primitive. The men yelled at us to get our asses up with them. I thought for a second they might be rangers getting mad at us for having too big of a fire, but once I glanced at their clothing and saw their baggy pants and their black and grey hoodie type clothing, I knew we were not that lucky. I had heard in the past that drug dealers or the Mexican cartel had been caught hiding large amounts of marijuana plants in the forest and wondered if these people were some of the men who somehow felt that we were a threat to their crops. I was in fear of our lives. The men didn't directly touch us or threaten us with violence, but I definitely felt an implied threat in their tone and believed that we really had no choice in the matter. My brother who was still crying and I followed the lead male while the other three men fell back behind us. My brother put his hand on my shoulder and was visibly shaking. He then whispered to me that we were walking in the direction of the 60 foot rock cliff and that we needed to run. I was petrified and had not been paying attention to where they were leading us but realized he was right. I stopped dead in my tracks and said to the men, What are you going to do to us? The lead male stated, Nothing, but we're just going to have some fun with you guys. I felt that we really had no choice but to do what they said and hope that they were all merely screwing with us and that this would be all over soon. After about 30 seconds of walking, we arrived to the jumping spot on top of the boulder, overlooking the gorge swimming area. One of the men stated, have you guys ever jumped from here? I told him that yes, I had, but my brother had not since it was a pretty high jump and was very dangerous for most people due to the height and the rocks below. The men laughed again and called my brother a pussy. I told them that we were not as I had jumped from the spot before, but that it was not safe to do in the dark. The men then formed a half circle around us and one of the men said, I want to see, show us that you are not a bunch of pussies. I screamed at them that it was too dangerous at night and during the day it was dangerous enough. I told them that there are many rocks that you have to avoid and that if you did not jump correctly, it could kill you. I pleaded and pleaded. The men just laughed and took a few steps closer to us. I was beyond scared and could hear my heart beating through my ears. 
My brother at this point was crying loudly and saying things I could not understand. He was beyond terrified and so was I. I grabbed his hand and told him we needed to get away from these men as we were in great danger. I told him that I had jumped off the rock boulder into the water before and knew where to jump, and that if he jumped with me, we would be okay. I told him I would use my flashlight to help guide us and I would tell him where to put his feet and how far to jump. The men laughed at us as we had our conversation and showed zero humanity or pity. I grabbed my brother and placed his feet with my hand onto a specific place on the rock ledge where I remember jumping from last time I was there months before. I explained to him that I knew he was scared and so was I, but we needed to jump out as far as we can and slightly to the right, otherwise we would hit the rocks. He was shaking, crying, and kept telling me that he couldn't do it. He then urinated on the floor. The men laughed and laughed and kept saying they couldn't believe how scared we were. I then told my brother that we needed to jump now and that it would be okay if he listened to me. I told him that after we jumped we would swim to the shore on the right and would hide in the bushes until daybreak and would then go for help. I then grabbed his hand tightly and told him that when we hit the water he needed to tuck his legs and arms in so that they would not get hurt from the impact of the water and instructed him that he needed to swim hard to the surface as we would sink pretty far down due to the height we were jumping from. I grabbed his hand and we jumped. I pulled him hard with me to ensure that we would be safe from the rocks below and that he jumped far enough out. We fell for what seemed like a minute but was only a few seconds in reality. My brother yelled all the way down in a way I have never heard from another human being before. Terror, dread and fear of imminent death reverberated from his voice. I felt helpless and almost forgot where we were for those few seconds, then we hit the water. As soon as we hit, I lost my grip on my brother's hand but I did hear a second impact in the water. I swam towards the surface with all my energy and took a deep breath. I then listened for my brother to surface but heard nothing. I panicked and dove into the water to try to grab him. Just as I dove, I felt his leg brush against my hand and realized that he was about to surface. I swam up again and heard my brother. He was crying and kept telling his arm hit the rock and you couldn't feel it anymore. The men above were laughing again and I heard one of them say, they fucking made it, those idiots. I then heard objects splashing in the water around us and realized they were throwing beer bottles or rocks or some other hard objects at us. I quickly grabbed my brother and helped him swim to the nearby shore. The whole time we swam, many objects landed dangerously close to us, and I felt that if any had hit us, it would have caused death or great bodily harm to us, especially if we were hit in the head. My flashlight had been lost in the fall and we were in complete darkness. We reached the water's edge and I pulled my brother to shore. Objects continued to rain down around us and we could hear the men yelling and laughing. I told my brother that we needed to run. He was crying and holding his injured arm that he could not feel or use it. It had a deep cut around the elbow and even with just the starlight we could see that this was a serious injury. We stumbled down the tree line and began making our way through the darkness to one of the main trails from past memory. We fell again and again and were cut by branches and rocks all over our bodies as we wandered about down the overgrown trail. Everything in my body told me to keep going and to get as far away from these men as we could. We walked for many minutes until we could no longer hear the men and we waited. I wrapped my brother's arm with my shirt and told him that it was over and that all we had to do was wait until morning for help. We sat in that spot all night and my brother cried and shook for hours. I just put my arm around him and patted his head, as I did when we were children whenever he had a panic attack and our parents were not around. At daybreak we could finally see the severity of his injuries. He had a deep gash in his arm and his shoulder was obviously dislocated. I helped him hike up the nearby trail and we walked all the way back to the base camp ranger station. We explained what happened to the rangers and they sent two armed officers to go investigate the location. My brother was sent to a nearby hospital for treatment and I joined him on the ambulance ride over. The rangers and the police never found the men but did retrieve most of our gear. The scary thing about this incident is that the same week two teenage boys were found dead at the bottom of the gorge jumping area and that their group had encountered the same people as we did at their camping location with similar machete objects who chased them off their camping spot. I am glad to be alive and my brother and I have never gone camping alone again or have never been back to that location. All that we have left from the incident are scars on my brother's arm, hospital bills, and a lot of trauma. An article of the death of the two teenage boys is below. I can only hope their deaths were accident as the authorities ruled.
I did not find out about their deaths until seven years after, but was horrified about the similar circumstances and timing of the two events. As to the men that forced us to jump that day, let's not meet again. Every summer, my family makes the trip from Texas to Vermont. Two summers ago, my parents bought a new home, and for some reason, our house smelt really, really terrible. So, my mom went to the local candle and scent shop and ended up bonding with the woman who owned it. She convinced her to give me a summer job. The first month went smooth, with really only a few bad customers. One day, I was checking inventory in the back when I heard the bell above the door ring. I walked to the front of the store, calling out to whoever just entered, but no one replied to me or appeared to be in the store, so I just forgot about it and moved on with my day, blowing it off as the wind. That night, when I was getting into my car, I found a piece of notebook paper stuffed in the space between the slit of rubber in my window. It had my full name and a crudely drawn picture of a wedding ring. What the hell? I blew this off as my best friend and coworker, Courtney, trying to scare me like she always did. The next day at work, I told Courtney that she wasn't funny. She told me that she didn't do anything. Courtney always owns up to her pranks. After that, I was creeped out, but again dismissed it as another one of my friends. I was sitting at the register playing on my iPhone when I heard someone walk into the shop. I looked up to see a rugged man at the counter. I was a 4 foot 11 teenage girl and this man towered over me at least a foot. Are you Sarah M? He said this in a deep slow voice. I had never seen this man before in my life, so how could he know my name? I didn't know what to do, so I remained silent and started to slowly back away from the counter, grabbing my phone, heading towards the back exit. I'm sorry about the note in your car, I was just too nervous to ask you out. At this point, I was about to nope the hell out of there, but I knew I couldn't just leave the shop unattended with the creep in there. My boss would literally murder me and maybe he will leave anyway. I'm really sorry, but I have a boyfriend back home and I'm 16. I tried my best not to sound intimidated, although I probably sounded like a chipmunk that pissed itself. Well, you look like a girl that hasn't had good fun in a while. I didn't know what to do. I started to pull the mace out of my pocket. I think I'm okay on that, but you should leave, sir, before I call the police. At this, he looked like he would kill, and tried to pull me over the counter. He had me in a tight grip and he tried to pull a small kitchen knife out of his pocket, but before a second thought, I pepper sprayed him directly in the face. He loosened his grip and I grabbed my phone and bolted to my car. I locked myself in the car and called 911. It would be 10 minutes until the police could get to my location. The operator told me to start my car in case he got up. I tried to start my car, but it wouldn't budge. My one thought was, in what way will I be cut up? I could hear the police car pull into the parking lot. When the police found the man inside the shop, he was crying behind the counter. Apparently, this man had stalked me for three summers. He lived in a cabin in the mountains, and he hadn't talked to anyone for ten years and he had severe mental problems. A few years ago, he saw me and my family hiking through the woods and felt that we were meant to be. A match made in heaven, in his opinion. A few weeks later, I had my car looked at. The throttle had been missing, explaining why my car wouldn't move when I tried to start it. I still go to work at the scent shop, but I'm now 21 and married. I wonder where he is now, but please, mountain man, let's not meet again. This story happened about two years ago while I was in university working on my degree in biology. I had signed up for a trip to gather some samples for an experiment. Some students in the ecology department were going to run. It required the collection of samples from several sites, so they recruited biology, ecology, and forestry majors to help them complete the sampling in a shorter period. The area my group was to take samples from was a few hours from my university in the Pacific Northwest. There are nine of us in my group, eight students and a supervising professor. We got to the campsite in the late evening and set up our tents. 
One of the other students had brought a big container of split pea soup from home and was sharing it with the others on the trip. I don't really care for split pea soup, so I declined the offer. Everyone had some except me, one other student, and the professor. Come the next morning, the five students who had eaten the soup were not in the best shape. They were in the grips of some gnarly food poisoning and were in no shape to hike for eight or nine hours to collect the samples we needed. The professor who was supervising us had originally some rules, such as traveling in groups of at least two, and we had to return to camp by nightfall. Now, those rules were tossed out to make sure we kept our timetable to collect all the required samples. We were told to do your best to complete the work assigned as long as you can do it safely. That morning, I set out for a long day of hiking. After a mile or so, I ran into the stream I was supposed to follow. I needed to travel about four miles upstream, stopping every quarter mile to collect samples of water and soil. This meant I had to hustle to get back before dark. Halfway through the day, I realized that wasn't going to happen. About two miles into my hike, I stopped for lunch, sitting on a log overlooking the stream. The scene was really peaceful until I smelled the cigarettes. It wasn't the smell of the cigarette being smoked, more the musty smell of a heavy smoker's car where cigarette butts had been left to ferment for weeks on end. I looked around but couldn't see anyone. I just assumed the wind had blown the scent from some hunter or hiker over to me, but minutes later, the smell hadn't faded. The vegetation in the area wasn't that thick, but there were still a lot of places for someone to duck behind a tree or a bush. I was unnerved that someone was apparently staying so close enough to me for me to smell them this long without so much as a word. I quickly packed up the trash for my lunch and continued up the stream. The musty cigarette smell went away for the next few hours. It wasn't until I arrived at my last sample location late into dusk that I smelt it again. The woods were getting really dim by this point. Looking back on it, it was a really stupid idea to stay out so late, as just hiking back to the camp in the dark would be pretty dangerous, even without a cigarette smoking stalker. Having just put the collection tubes in my back, I shined my flashlight around the darkened woods looking for whoever was giving off the smell. I didn't see anything that caught my attention. I would actually be more correct to say that I saw too many things in the dim light that may have been a head sticking out from behind a tree or someone crouching low in the foliage. I didn't like the idea of being in the dark woods with a stranger who for the second time was lurking near me without revealing themselves. So I began to double time it back to the stream. I made much better time on the way back even though it was dark because I didn't have to stop to take any samples. Even so, I didn't get back to the camp till a bit before 10. I was the last one to get back and everyone but the professor was already asleep. I didn't mention the cigarette smell to the professor because he seemed tired as it was, and he headed to his bed in the RV soon after I got back. I headed to my tent soon after. At some point in the night, I woke up needing to pee. I decided to head in the woods to do my business as I knew some of the other students were still feeling ill and needed the RV toilet for more urgent matters than just having to take a leak. I walked about a hundred feet into the woods, found a tree and did what I needed to do. As I turned back to the camp, something caught my eye. Somewhere off in the woods was a tiny red glow. I was confused as to what it was until it flared momentarily and I realized it was the cherry of a cigarette. I stood there for a while watching the red ember glow, fade then move slightly closer to the ground as to whoever was smoking would take it out of their mouth. Not being able to see the person, I assumed that they were watching the camp. I didn't know if they had seen me make my way into the woods or not, as the fire had been doused and the moon was only half full, so there wasn't very much light. I made my way slowly back to the camp as quietly as I could and entered the RV to wake up the professor. I told him about the person smoking in the woods and about the smell of cigarettes earlier in the day. However, when we got outside the RV, the ember from the cigarette was gone. My professor woke up the other student who hadn't come down with food poisoning, and we took turns watching over the camp. I didn't see or smell anything else when I was on guard duty and went to sleep when the professor woke up for his turn. In the morning, the professor, the other student and I went to where I guessed the smoker had been standing the night before, and sure enough, we found about 10 cigarette butts on the ground next to the tree. The tree itself looked like someone had been twisting and stabbing a knife or other sharp object into it, 
As the bark and the outer layers of the wood had been damaged and chipped away, the professor decided that the group should head back that day even though we hadn't collected all of the samples we were assigned to be on the safe side. We packed up camp and drove down the thin dirt trail without incident. The second we got onto the paved highway though, a white paneled van pulled out of the clearing just off the shoulder and began following us. The van stayed behind us all the way back, pulling off the highway when we did, taking the same surface streets that we did, and only stopped following us when we turned onto the road leading to our university campus. Everyone was freaked out by this, but it was around 9 at night on a weekend so the security office on campus was closed. We decided to unload the RV and call it a night, as the van hadn't followed us onto campus. I offered to help the professor catalog and store the collection tubes from our trip, so it was another couple hours before I left the biological science building and started heading toward the dorm building I lived in. I stepped out into the cool night air and began walking, my professor having left the building in the other direction to get into his car and drive home. It was a couple dozen feet outside the building, which was now locked, when I was hit with the musty smell of old cigarettes. I looked around and about 25 yards away in the darkness off the footpath I saw a cherry of a cigarette smoldering away. I was pretty scared at this point, but hoped it was only a student or some faculty staying late having a smoke. I couldn't completely convince myself of this, as the musty cigarette smell was the same as what I smelled in the woods the previous night. I started down the footpath and soon passed whoever was smoking. A hundred feet or so later, I looked over my shoulder and saw the cigarette cherry bobbing in the darkness. The smoker was following me. This creeped me out a bit more, but I still held it together. That is until I rounded a small stand of trees and saw a white paneled van parked alone in the parking lot. I took off at a sprint towards my dorm building. I looked over my shoulder a few steps into my run. I saw the cherry of the cigarette fall to the ground and the dark shape beginning to move after me. I didn't look back but I could hear someone running in the grass off the footpath. I got to the entrance of my dorm building and frantically waved my key card in front of the key reader that controlled the door lock. As soon as I hear the soft beep, I open the door, jump in and shut the door quickly. I stopped and peered through the glass door. I saw the dark shape stop short of the lit pathway. I just watched for a minute or two. Then I saw the spark of a lighter. The light is just barely bright enough to illuminate the shaggy beard and brim of a baseball cap before it disappears and was replaced with the red glow of a cigarette. I turned and headed up the stairs to my dorm room. By the time I get to my window overlooking the same yard I had just ran through, there is no trace of the dark figure or the light of a cigarette. After that, I didn't see the white paneled van again or smell that musky cigarette smell. I hope I never do. For some background, this happened back in 2003 when I was 6 years old. I'm from Michigan and this experience takes place over the summer. In the area I live in, we have a community pool that everyone who lives in the community is welcome to use. A special event this pool throws is called a midnight swim. The whole point of this is for the pool to be open till midnight. The pool usually closed at 9pm Sunday through Thursday and 10 p.m. on Friday and Saturday. The midnight swims were held on Friday nights. There are three midnight swims held each year I always looked forward to. Before you think I had bad parents for letting two six-year-olds stay out swimming until midnight, my brother and I were both excellent swimmers since we had learned how to swim at age three. And for being out till midnight, well, we lived in a safe neighborhood where nothing bad ever happened. On this particular day, we had to wait until 9pm before we could go to the pool because my parents had to work late and our sitter didn't want to leave the house and take us to the pool. So 9 o'clock rolls around and my brother and I are ready to go. My parents get home and get ready themselves. As my parents are getting ready, me being my 6 year old self gets bored and decided to wait for them out on the front porch. A little layout of my neighborhood. There is a main road just to the left of my house. Anyways, I'm walking around on my front lawn when I hear a voice call out to me saying, Hey kid, come over here. At first, I thought the voice was coming from inside my head. Don't judge me, I was six. But after hearing the voice call out a few more times and looking around, 
I spot a man standing in the shadows of some trees. My parents had taught me not to talk to strangers, but I was standing right in front of my house and I thought it would be safe. I asked the man what he wanted and he said he wanted to show me something. Realizing that there was something strange with how the man hadn't come out of the shadows, I told the man no and I was going back inside. The man didn't like this one bit. He scolded me for not listening to my elders and to do what he said. At this point, I was shocked. I didn't expect this man to yell at me, but I stupidly decided to not go inside and stay on the porch. I told the man that I didn't know him, to which he replied that he was a friend of my parents and that they wouldn't mind me going over to talk to him. It was at this point my dad had walked out and asked me who I was talking to, but by the time I had pointed to the trees, the man was gone. So, to the man that tried to lure a six-year-old boy into the woods, let's not meet ever again. In October of 2008, the body of an 11-year-old boy was discovered under a shallow layer of vegetation over 50 miles from his home. A group of hunters found him laying on top of a hill in Logan Creek State Forest, located in Reynolds County, Missouri, near the foothills of the Ozark Mountains. The remains were turned over to local law enforcement, where they were DNA matched to Billy Evanston, who was reportedly missing in the summer of 2005. He was later positively identified by members of his family. An autopsy failed to provide sufficient answers to the many questions this case presented. Evanston's was the fifth body associated with what authorities dubbed the Logan Creek incidents. Each victim was found in the same forest and bore particular similarities. Evanston was no exception. First, despite having been in the woods for over three years without any kind of preservation methods undertaken, the body showed no signs of decay. There was no obvious cause of death. However, an autopsy revealed that there was no blood anywhere in his circulatory system, and tissue damage to blood vessel walls led the medical examiner to believe that it somehow combusted and burned away without damaging other parts of the body. Also, in each one of the victims, the optic nerve inexplicably appeared to have been severed. A disposable camera was discovered with Billy Evanston's corpse, along with a pocket-sized composition notebook belonging to 17-year-old Eric O'Neill, the first victim of the Logan Creek incidents. His body was discovered in 1997, but there was no other evidence found. It is unknown why or how the notebook reached the opposite side of the forest as O'Neill's, but graphological analysis revealed the handwriting inside belonged to him. The notebook, camera, and a series of drawings attributed to the third victim, seven-year-old Jennifer Marlowe, discovered in 2001, form the entire foundation of this case, as documentation of the events leading up to the other victims' deaths have not yet been found. The film in Evanston's camera was developed and the pictures thoroughly reviewed by an investigation team. Eight photographs were taken. The remaining 16 left on the reel are blank. Three highly accredited photo forensic analysis agree that the images were in no way altered with. The investigative team worked tirelessly to match descriptions from O'Neill's book to each photo. These excerpts bear striking similarities to the photographs, even though they were written eight years before the photographs were taken. These similarities helped investigators piece together a rough timeline all the Logan Creek victims likely followed. Photograph 1, dated July 8, 2005. This is a photo from Billy Evanston's 11th birthday party, where his mother gave him the camera as a gift. The young boy is seated at his kitchen table surrounded by a group of children from his class. A cake reading Happy Birthday Billy sits in front of him. His father is pictured lighting the candles. His mother is the photographer. Photograph number 2, dated July 11, 2005. This image shows the Evanston's backyard at dusk captured by Billy's bedroom window on the second floor. Billy is believed to have taken this picture. At first glance, there is nothing out of the ordinary, but upon further inspection, three slender gray figure-like digits can be seen curled over Billy's window. The owner of the limb is not pictured and remains unidentified. Corresponding journal entry, dated November 30th, 1997. I have no idea where I am. It feels like someone is driving an ice pick into my left eye and my memory is fuzzy. The only thing that I can remember is the end of the dream I had last night. I was in bed and heard something from outside in the middle of the night. I know that it was a dream because it was daylight, like brighter than the sun daylight. But in the middle of the night, I got out of bed and went to the window. 
When I stuck my head out to look around, everything went dark. Then at least four hands clamped down on my shoulders and yanked me forward and then drug me upward. I'm in the woods now. I've wandered around all day. I am completely lost. I haven't seen any other hikers, campers, or any other human beings, and it's getting dark. Sometimes I can hear footsteps behind me, but when I turn around, I can't see anything. There aren't even any animals or bugs. Photograph number three, dated July 15th, 2005. Taken the day Billy was reported missing by his parents, this is the first photograph of Logan Creek State Forest. Billy's parents stated that they had no idea how he got there. They say they had put him into bed the night before and could not find him the next morning. His window was open but there was no signs of forced entry or an intruder. Billy's disappearance at the time was ruled a kidnapping. The picture shows a perfectly circular clearing in an otherwise densely forested area. What little vegetation remains appears to be in the process of turning to dust. A thick blanket of grey ash covers the clearing completely, but cannot be found outside of the border of the circle. Three trees stand untouched in the center. Original speculation pointed to a fire in this area of Logan Creek Forest, but it provided no explanation for the geometric pattern of damage or the intact trees left behind. The photographer is unknown, but believed to be Billy Evanston. Corresponding journal excerpt, dated December 4th, 1997. I thought it was ash at first, but our tool shed burned down when I was a kid. This isn't what ash feels like. I'm not sure how else to explain it. Ashes are flaky and almost have a papery texture to them. This stuff feels like sand. There was this weird static energy or something in the circle. I don't know how else to describe it, but all the hair in my body stood straight up, and I heard this quiet humming coming from the back of my head as I approached the trees. If I stayed there too long, I felt nauseous. I'm taking some of the sand or whatever it is back to have someone look at it if I can ever get home. Photograph number 4, dated July 12th, 2005. This photograph shows a handprint on a tree trunk. It is the same color as the gray clearing, and three elongated digits connected to an oval-shaped palm contrasted starkly against the deep wrap of the dark tree. Investigators pointed out the similarities between the handprint and the three fingers in photograph 2. The photographer is unknown but believed to be Billy Evanston. Corresponding journal entry, no date. I've lost track of how long I've been here. I'm beginning to think that I was not dreaming the night that I was taken. My shoulders were sore and I found purple and green bruises under my shirt. They weren't human hands. They had a thumb of sorts but only two fingers. I took my shirt off and found them all over my torso. Photograph number 5, dated. July 14th, 2005. This haunting image appears to have been taken at dusk. Pictured are the branches of several trees in the forest. The photo is blurry, but six pairs of glowing eyes peek out among the leaves. Further inspection revealed hunched humanoid figures woven between branches staring down at the camera. The creatures have yet to be identified. The photographer is unknown, but is believed to be Billy Evanston. Corresponding journal entry no date. They are watching me. I can't sleep anymore. I just sit on the ground, hugging my knees to my chest and keeping my eyes shut. I can still tell they're looking at me. Sometimes I hear footsteps behind me during the day. I can see a figure out of the corner of my eye for a second. I don't know if I'm getting better at finding them or if they just want me to see them. Photograph number 6, dated July 15th, 2005. This photograph shows four lights streaking through the sky above Logan Creek Forest. It closely resembles many other photographs claiming to have captured UFOs or extraterrestrial life. A finger in front of the camera lens covers the top left corner of the frame. The photographer is unknown but believed to be Billy Evanston. Corresponding journal entry, no date. A huge wiring sound, like a jet taking off. They want me to think they're leaving, trying to take my guard down. I've been running now, but the woods just get deeper. There is no way out, but up. Photograph number 7, dated July 15th, 2005. This photograph is of the gray substance, like what was found in the clearing from photograph 3. This one was taken from inside the clearing. The camera is angled down, showing a pair of legs from the knees down. Billy Evanston is believed to have taken the photo, as well as have appeared in it. 
particles of the still, unidentified substance coats his feet and seems to be snaking up the rest of his legs. Corresponding journal entry. No date. Please help me. That humming sound is all I can hear. The ground has turned against me, and that grey dust can crawl right up my legs and down my throat. It's hot. It burns. There's no way out, but up. Photograph number 8, dated July 15th, 2005. The last photo on Evanston's camera is by far the most unsettling. Pictured as Billy Evanston being drugged through the forest by two unidentified figures, which, though blurry, display striking resemblances to the figures from photograph 5. They are not facing the camera. The figures appear to be tall, but hunched over. Evanston's mouth is open as if he's screaming, but his body seems still. Some of the members of the investigative team believe that Evanston was dead when this photograph was taken. The photographer is unknown. Corresponding journal entry. No date. They took me up, but I can't escape. There's no way out. Jennifer Marlowe was reported missing in December 1995, but was not found until March of 2001. When her parents were questioned about her disappearance, they responded the same as the families of the other victims. They had put Jennifer to bed the night before, but there was no sign of her the next morning, no evidence of a break-in or kidnapping. She had seemingly vanished into thin air. When asked if they noticed any strange behavior before her disappearance, they provided a series of drawings done by Jennifer in the weeks leading up to her abduction. Her parents didn't think anything of the strange creatures depicted, rather they thought it was fueled by the seven-year-old's imagination or too many science fiction movies. The drawings contain various everyday scenes such as family portraits, busy streets, and Marlowe's backyard, but blended in with the normal events are gray figures with elongated digits resembling those described by Eric O'Neill and photographed by Billy Evanston. Sometimes they are waving, sometimes they held their hand to their side, but one of their arms was always extended with one finger pointing upward. Originally, investigators believe this to be a kidnapping, an unfortunate abduction resulting in the murder of a child, but a prevalent crime nonetheless. However, the inexplainable details of the Logan River incidents have led several investigators to explore the idea of some sort of supernatural involvement. No bodies have been discovered since Billy Evanston's. But it is still unclear which of the thousands of current missing persons will return home and which will end up in the Logan Creek State Forest. Jefferson National Forest lies just north of Blacksburg, Virginia. My absolute favorite part of the forest is Pandapaz Pond. The pond itself is scenic and beautiful, but the best part is the miles and miles of hiking trails accessible from the pond. I try to hike between 3 to 6 miles per week. I do this for two reasons. Firstly, because it's great exercise, and secondly, because it helps keep me sane. Today, however, the sanity part changed. Today, just like I do every week, I packed a few bottles of water and a collapsible water bowl from my dog Lana and headed for the pond. When I parked, I noted six or seven cars in the parking lot and thought about how I'd for sure need to keep Lana close to me so she wouldn't bother any of the other hikers or pond goers. I always turn on a hiking app on my phone as soon as I get out of the car. The app helps me gauge the distance I've hiked and most importantly it helps ensure that I don't get lost. For any of you that may have knowledge of the area, you know that it's borderline impossible to get lost in these trails but I like to have the security. I got out of the car, shouldered my bag grabbed the dog leash and turned on the app. I was greeted with a familiar start workout and I began walking towards the pond. Everything seemed perfect, the temperature was cool, the sky was overcast for the first half mile and I was completely alone. As Lana and I rounded a bend, we saw another hiker. This hiker was a man in his early to mid twenties and was moving. His eyes were wide and unblinking and he looked nervous. He was running, but I doubted I would have been able to keep up with him. Lana and I stepped aside to let him pass and I offered a friendly good morning. This guy never stopped looking ahead, he never even acknowledged my existence. As he passed, I pulled out my phone to get a video of his odd behavior and I noticed I had absolutely no service. My hiking app's GPS showed me standing on a blank map. My mile per minute tracker had skyrocketed to 2 hours per mile and was steadily climbing. I turned the app off to save battery and I decided I would just stick to the trails I already knew. When I finally reached the pond, it was a ghost town. Usually, there are older couples and moms pushing jogger strollers around the pond loop. But today, there wasn't a soul in sight. 
The combination of the deserted pond and the strange wide-eyed hiker was giving me an uneasy feeling, and for a moment I considered turning around and heading home. As I was standing there contemplating on what to do next, I felt Lana pulling enthusiastically on her leash. Okay, okay Lana, let's go, I said as we moved forward. There's this section of pond loop that forces you to cross a wooden bridge. The bridge separates the pond and a small section of marshland. Usually when you cross it, you can hear bullfrogs bellowing and see ducks swimming around lazily. Today though, there was nothing. No sound, no movement, nothing. I found it a little unnerving, but as we were so close to the trail, I decided to push on. We took our usual route, Lady Sniper Trail to Joe Pie Trail to Poverty Creek Trail. Usually, once we hit Poverty Creek Trail, we take a right and head back to the car. But today was such perfect hiking weather, I decided to take a left and try a new trail I'd never been on before. I double checked my location on the post trail map and I decided I would follow Poverty Creek Trail to Royale Trail, then loop back towards the parking lot about halfway down Royale. As soon as I turned left onto Poverty Creek, I experienced the worst case of vertigo I've ever experienced. I leaned on a low hanging branch for a few minutes to try to regain my composure. When I finally felt normal again, I decided to snap off a branch and use it as a walking stick, just in case the vertigo came back. The branch gave me a ton of resistance before finally coming off. However, it didn't make a sound. I stopped and stared at the branch that should have come off with an ear-shattering crack and I realized I couldn't hear anything other than my own breath. I looked up to the sky, barely visible through the canopy of trees. The sky was getting a lot darker than when I first stepped onto the trails. I felt my heart racing. Calm down, it looks just like it's gonna rain, that's why you don't hear any animals, I thought to myself. For some stupid reason I decided to keep going. I could have and most definitely should have turned around, but I kept going and turned onto Royale Trail. After about 15 minutes of walking and hearing only the sound of Lana panting, I figured I should be close to the point where I loop back and get out of the woods. Another minute or two of walking presented me with a trail that headed into the general direction I needed to go. The trail was unmarked, unlike all the other trails. Whatever, just get out of these woods before you get stuck here in the rain. I said this out loud, mostly just to break the silence. This unmarked trail looked pretty well traveled, so I assumed it was okay. I assumed, so very wrong. The trail quickly narrowed to nothing more than a deer trail, but it was going the way I needed to go. I decided to follow it. The vegetation started to get really thick, and I had to duck my head so I didn't get hit in the face by stray branches barreling through the bushes like I should have been, loud enough to wake the dead, but instead I heard nothing but my own heavy breathing. Suddenly I fell through the brush into a clearing, on my hands and knees I started to laugh how crappy this hike was going and looked over at Lana, she was frozen in place, all of her hair was raised and her teeth were bared, she looked straight ahead and let out a low growl, I looked up, hoping it was just a deer or a rabbit, instead I saw something that made my blood run cold. In the center of the clearing stood a man in camouflage. He was facing away from me with his head down. Lana growled again and I saw the man's head perk up. Run, he said in a low gruff voice. I ran, faster than I thought my feet could carry me, little Lana somehow matching my stride. As I silently crashed through the brush I turned to see if the man was following us. He was, but he wasn't running but still seemed to be gaining on me. Every time I looked over my shoulder he was a little closer. I could see his eyes but he flashed an unpleasant white smile as he gained on us. I knew that I had to be close to 460, the highway that runs through the forest, and I knew if I could just make it to the pavement that I'd have a chance of making it home. Run little piggy. The man taunted just behind me. I saw the highway and changed direction. My legs screamed for me to stop and every breath I took felt like broken glass was filling my lungs. I dove through the tree line and heard the man laugh as I crash landed onto the shoulder of 460. I scrambled to my feet and turned around just in time to see the man melt back into the woods. The last part of him I saw was that white smile. The silence that I had been in for the better part of an hour stopped. The sound of passing cars and semi-trucks suddenly blasted me, and I realized I was safe. I looked around and got my bearings and realized I was still at least two miles from my car. I started walking back towards the parking lot, making sure to keep ample distance between myself and the tree line. During breaks in the passing cars I could hear twigs snapping and I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I finally made it back to my car. I was shaking so bad I dropped the keys twice trying to unlock the door. As I was closing my car door, I heard the man's eerie taunt again. Run little piggy. I've come to the decision that I will never hike there again.